Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ralph Hextra. I'm Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this, the seventh event in this Provost series this year. Um, as you know, the, the title of the, I, I actually sometimes stumble over it myself, it's long enough, Provost Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. And um, for those of you who've come to other ones, you know, we've been looking at this topic, very, very broad topic from a number of points of view. And today we'll have a number of points of view. Um, so in fact, um, what we might say is that this forum will definitely give you your money's worth because we have assembled here quite a series of speakers and discussants. So our featured presenters today, whose titles will come later in their proper introductions, are Stephen Casper, Christopher Lecuyer, Cyrus Modi, Daniel Sommer, and Mary Walshock. We're delighted and privileged that all of you distinguished speakers have been able to join us here today. We're also very, very pleased to have an eminent set of discussants to join in the discussion. Martin Kenny, David Maury, Sean Randolph, David Hodges, Mario Biagioli, Bill Lacey, and Andrew Hargadon. So our five featured speakers today will make presentations based on their chapters in the book, Public Universities and Regional Growth, Insights from the University of California, which is forthcoming from oddly, Stanford University Press. Uh, the order of activities, but we're, we're, we're very grateful. Um, you know, I could say other things, but I won't. The order of activities will be this. The book's editors, Professors Kenny and Maori, will make introductory remarks and speaker introductions. Our series of five presentations will follow, each one accommodating contributions by discussants and audience questions. And at the end of our program, Professor Kenny will offer some concluding thoughts. So there's much content to cover today, so I'll only offer one thought of my own on today's event. Last year in this, the Provost Forums have addressed the topic of the public university and the social good by focusing on a wide range of subjects. These subjects have ranged from access and affordability for students to budget issues and the so-called privatization of higher education to the role of the humanities at the university and in society and academic freedom. Today's forum brings us back to our roots, so to speak, for from the very beginning, the promotion of regional economic growth has been a central goal of the public university and perhaps especially the land-grant university. Today, we very rightly recognize other equally worthy goals as well for our universities, public and private alike, but it's important that we never lose sight of this long-standing core function. Today's event promises to demonstrate with uncommon persuasiveness the great benefit that the University of California and all public universities bring to their surrounding regions. Before I leave the subject of our program, let me remind you all that you're invited to continue discussion of public universities and regional growth during the reception immediately following uh, our panel discussion. A very, very quick look ahead. Today's Provost Forum will be followed by two more yet this academic year. Details are available on my website and flyers are forthcoming, so let me now just tantalize you with the topics. On Wednesday, May 7th, Daryl Smith, Professor of Education and Psychology at the Claremont Graduate University will speak on the topic, Diversity in the University. And on Monday, June 2nd, we finish our season with something of a departure, but one that I think you'll say eminently justifies itself. Six of our undergraduates will present their findings of their honors research projects into the ideas and concerns of their fellow UC Davis undergraduates concerning the public university and social good. I hope that all of you will be able to attend these two concluding events of this year's programs and um, we'll look forward, as I do, to the assemblage that we'll be presenting next year. So before I conclude, some thanks. I want to thank the Provost Forum's organizing committee for their ongoing efforts and expertise in planning and are arranging uh, the events both last year and this. The two campus entities that have joined my office to co-sponsor this event, the Child Center for Entrepreneurship and the Community and Regional Development Pro Program. Our experts responsible for introductions and moderating discussions, Professors Martin Kenny and David Maury, 
Our discussants again, Sean Randolph, David Hodges, Mario Biagioli, Bill Lacey, and Andy Harganon. And last but not least, our great thanks to Professor Stephen Casper, Christophe Lequier, Cyrus Modi, Daniel Sommer, and Associate Vice Chancellor Mary Walshock for speaking with us today. Thank you and uh, welcome all. Martin. Professor Kenny. Thank you, Ralph. So, oh, let's see, the acknowledgments. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the University of California's Office of the President, Bill Tucker and some of his staff for, oh, there he is, for, put my glasses on, uh, for uh, the funding uh, that made, to Dave, Mary, and I that made this book possible. Um, this great thanks to you. Acknowledge the hard work of all the authors for the chapters, which uh, I hope you all will order the book when it comes out. And acknowledge the provost for making this one of the events in his series. I'd like to briefly talk about the context of the California economy. California is today the quintessential uh, knowledge-based economy. 10 of the top 50 uh, universities by the Shanghai Jiao Tung rating are in the state of California, 10 of the top 50. There's no country that is equal in that way to us. Only Japan and the rest of the US file more patents with the USPTO than California does. So the rest of the US does beat California and Japan, but none of the others. And, and California receives over 40% of all venture capital investment in the United States and 40% of all the US initial public stock offerings of new technology firms are from this state, or the firm is headquartered in the state. So it sort of gives you an idea, the IPOs will give you an idea of why the UC budget is the way it is. Because when IPOs, when we have IPOs, we get a lot of tax dollars, and when the IPO market closes down, we don't have the tax dollars. So there are some direct relationships here with, uh, with our knowledge-based economy. So uh, the, the three problems, the background for the book is three problems in the literature that we, uh, that we Dave and I really thought were important, and that's the remarkable na lack of knowledge about the contribution of the UC campuses to California's economy, the diversity of technology transfer paths, and the disciplinary differences in transfer processes that Dave, in a moment, will, will speak in greater detail to. So we found experts to write each chapter, and we've gathered a wonderful group of discussants from this campus and from the Bay Area to talk about it, each of these chapters. So with that, let me introduce Dave Mowry, who will give us some introductory uh, remarks. Dave is the author or editor of 12 books and over 100 articles and book chapters. He has served on numerous national and international committees that have worked on issues related to R&D, technology, and the organization of R&D. I mean, he is today one of the global experts on R&D. He's the author of de the definitive book on the effect of the Bayh-Dole Act, uh, in, on the U.S. universities and technology transfers. I believe it's on display. Hopefully, Margot uh, from Stanford University Press brought the book, and it's on display out there. And, you know, I can't describe what a privilege it's been to work as an editor with Dave on this book. And with that, I'll let so Dave take it away. Yeah. Well, we need to embarrass you, Dave. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you all uh, very much for coming, and uh, uh, let me add my uh, thanks uh, particularly to our discussants uh, for uh, making it possible to get some dialogue on these chapters. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, and uh, I certainly appreciate the efforts of Martin and uh, Provost Hexter in, uh, in organizing this, making it possible. Um, I'm just going to make a few preliminary remarks here about the uh, uh, kind of the context, uh, and these remarks are to some extent uh, reflected in the introductory chapter that uh, Martin Kenny and I drafted for this uh, 
volume, but I, I would not want you to assume that all of these views are shared equally by all of our contributors, uh, and I think we'll uh, <coughs> elaborate on that over the course of the afternoon. So this issue of the role of research universities in economic growth obviously is a long-standing uh, topic of debate in public policy and other circles, and it is one in which uh, the United States has um, uh, initiated a number of uh, new approaches. I mean, the land-grant universities themselves uh, were in part motivated by economic development concerns uh, back in the 1860s and in the 1970s. Uh, an important uh, legislative act, uh, the Bayh-Dole Act, really was uh, motivated in large part uh, both by frustrations experienced by universities in, in patenting and licensing their technologies, but also uh, by a larger concern uh, in, the, uh, uh, in Washington over U.S. competitiveness. And it really, the Bayh-Dole Act, which is described in excruciating detail in a number of uh, studies, focused very uh, much on encouraging, rationalizing, and simplifying the processes through which uh, academic uh, research advances, as well as research advances in government, uh, in federal laboratories, could be patented and licensed. Um, and the Bayh-Dole Act uh, is variously uh, con uh, credited with reviving U.S. competitiveness and, and all manner of uh, uh, perhaps uh, flimsily uh, sourced and supported uh, claims. Nevertheless, the Bayh-Dole Act has been an enormously influential model for uh, policy uh, throughout the uh, industrial economies, the OECD economies, in trying to enhance the contributions of research universities to knowledge-based growth, and has been widely imitated and emulated. Uh, and Bayh-Dole has also been followed by other policies, uh, federal policies, as well as state-level policies, to encourage so-called technology transfer. As um, Martin suggested, this has been the uh, uh, subject of the Bayh-Dole Act, the process of technology transfer, the contributions of research universities to economic growth, all have been the focus of a very large literature, uh, most of which I think, particularly uh, the literature with which I'm familiar with, uh, largely written from the perspective of economics, has focused on the countable uh, rather than necessarily the important. Uh, and also much of this literature has celebrated the accomplishments of the so-called entrepreneurial research universities that are viewed as the anchors of important uh, regional agglomerations of high-tech industry, notably Stanford and MIT. What we've tried to do in this volume is really uh, a couple of things. First is to look not to ignore the role of patenting and licensing uh, in the processes through which regional uh, research universities influence regional economic growth, but to go beyond that, look at other uh, uh, dimensions of this interaction, and also, and importantly, uh, look at some other institutions involved, and uh, in particular focus on a public research university, the University of California system. Also, look beyond uh, the biomedical disciplines and information technology, which have really attracted most of the attention in the scholarly literature, to broaden that to look at a, a broader set of uh, research disciplines, and to try to adopt a more uh, self-consciously historical perspective, uh, extending the narrative over multiple decades rather than looking at a five-year or a ten-year uh, uh, window. That was the aspiration, which was partially realized, uh, and there are a few important caveats and things to keep in mind in interpreting and, uh, and uh, generalizing uh, from the studies in this volume. Not all of the UC campuses are included, largely because of author availability uh, and, uh, and our uh, limited uh, network of contacts. Um, the cases themselves are, we believe, uh, illustrate important phenomena that are common across the disciplines represented here as well as others, but nevertheless one has to be very careful in assuming that these cases represent uh, the universe of interactions, knowledge-based growth, and the like. Um, and also, there's, a, there's another selection bias here, which is most of these cases involve fairly uh, successful uh, examples of 
research in the university, interacting with research in industry, and having regional uh, economic effects. Uh, this is not necessarily universally true of all uh, academic research or all academic research within the UC uh, campuses. Um, so let me just briefly talk about a, a few important themes that I believe come through uh, these case studies and uh, to some extent differ from much of the conventional wisdom in this literature that I referred to. First is I think the need to uh, more richly characterize the processes of technology transfer. It is occasionally and I think unrealistically uh, conceptualized as a one-way trip from you know, the laboratory bench through a complicated and occasionally conflictual uh, series of processes to industrial application and commercialization. I think what comes through quite strongly in uh, virtually all of these studies is that this is really a two-way interaction. And this is the two-way nature of this, I think, is extremely important in understanding uh, the contributions of the UC campuses to their regional economic uh, uh, development and also more generally in understanding some of what differentiates many U.S. research universities from their counterparts in other industrial economies. Uh, this two-way interaction relies on a two-way flow of people, a two-way flow of ideas and, uh, and knowledge and, and uh, certainly in uh, less a two-way flow but definitely an interaction that involves contributions of funding. Um, and really it's this, the porousness of the boundaries between universities and industry among researchers, among uh, the flow of ideas that I think uh, really uh, operates a very important source of dynamism in this innovation process. But, but rather than a one-way, it's a two-way interaction. And also these interactions occur through many different channels. You know, the, the people, very importantly, publication, consulting, patenting and licensing, also very important. But there are an array of parallel channels that themselves interact, you know, publishing influences, consulting influences, patenting. Uh, and, and this interdependence is very important as well, I think, to keep in mind in trying to understand the complexity of this interaction. A few other themes that are worth highlighting is, again, this, the, uh, the process of technology transfer, of knowledge-based growth centered around Silicon Valley or Route 128 in the Boston area, often has as its centerpiece the growth of small entrepreneurial firms, spin-off firms uh, uh, that uh, in many cases benefit from the proximity of universities for both uh, uh, hiring and for ideas. But I think if you look carefully at the historical record that we've laid out in a number of these studies, big firms matter too. Big proximate regional firms, IBM in San Jose, Qualcomm in San Diego, these are very important players uh, as sources of ideas, as sources of people, as sources in, in many cases of research funding. And also, over time, these firms play very important roles as sources of new firms themselves. In many cases, those new firms exploit uh, and uh, utilize ideas from university and the employees they're from. So this, the, the role of established uh, uh, firms is also very important. Um, a, uh, Another theme that comes through here is the evolution, the changing uh, nature of the interaction between academic research and industrial innovation over time. Also, the tendency in many of these cases for not just basic research within academia to be central to the kind of interactions that, are, uh, that both advance the academic and the industrial uh, research enterprise, but also applied research, most, most dramatically in the case of the wine industry, but also in many of the others. Uh, this mix of fundamental and applied work is very important. Finally, the feds are at the centerpiece of almost all of these stories because federal research funding it, particularly in the UC campus, but also more generally across the uh, research uh, universities in the United States, has been so central to laying the foundations uh, for the research enterprise within academia that in turn has uh, metamorphosed into this uh, enterprise that is able to engage with and benefit from industrial interaction. Um, I think, uh, and here I, I'm probably stepping onto more controversial territory, 
But what we conclude, and this is the editors, I think, uh, uh, speaking as much as the contributors, that the UC campuses really have contributed powerfully to regional economic development by focusing on their core missions of education and research. The economic impact of their research and training activities dwarfs that of formally delineated technology transfer activities. Um, you know, for example, the system-wide data on licensing income uh, from patents uh, for the period during which we can back out net income. You know, the net income is dwarfed uh, by industry-sponsored research funding. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is very important to keep in mind. It's really the research uh, uh, engine and the educational engine that drive this interaction with industry and that have been the source of these regional uh, economic benefits. Um, just as a footnote to that and something that comes through, I think, very strongly in the chapters by virtue of their ability to span different research areas is the fact that the value of patents varies greatly among different fields of research and also within any field of research. Uh, a patent is not a patent is not a patent. And I think this is very important to keep in mind. This has not been an issue inside the UC system, but for would-be evaluators of uh, the research enterprise in the United States, counting patents is a profoundly um, poor measure of uh, research performance. So, in conclusion, I think that uh, we, uh, uh, the editors, argue that patenting and licensing are important complements to the research and training missions that we believe to be the core, uh, certainly of the, of the UC system, and I think more generally of, uh, of public universities in particular in the United States. I think a critical challenge is managing patenting and licensing to support these core missions and to support this interaction and the complexity of this two-way uh, interaction. So with that, uh, I don't want to put us behind schedule. I think we're on schedule. And I will uh, turn the floor back over to uh, Martin, who really deserves most of the credit for uh, putting this project together. I was sort of uh, a caboose uh, and, uh, and, and very grateful for the opportunity to participate with uh, both the contributors and, and this uh, conference today. So thank you. Martin, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, for uh, those wonderful remarks. Next, we will start with, uh, we are both hosts, Napa Valley, UC Davis, and the Search for Quality. Dan Sumner, who uh, co-authored this chapter uh, with uh, Jim Lapsley, who, who unfortunately couldn't be here, is uh, a f not only a faculty member here in uh, Agriculture and Research Resource Economics, but he's the director of the University of California Ag Issues Center, a noted researcher. He has won numerous awards from the American Agricultural Economics Association, and in 1993 was the Assistant Secretary of Economics for the United States. I mean, I could go with every one of these authors and discussants. One could go on and on uh, reciting their accomplishments, so I'm going to be very brief and uh, not do them justice. The discussant will be uh, Bill Lacey, who is our Vice Provost for University Outreach and a, a member of my department. He has co-authored, co-authored, co-edited over 80 journal articles, book chapters, and six books on education, science policy, agricultural research, and extension, biotechnology, and biodiversity. He's one of the world's foremost authorities on the land-grant system and the Organization of Agricultural Research. And among many other awards and honors, uh, too numerous to mention, he's a fellow of, of the AAAS. So I mean, we're blessed to have a great chapter and uh, Bill Lacey uh, giving comments. So Dan, why don't you take it away? I promised Martin I could do this in uh, nine minutes and 42 seconds, so hold me to that. Let's see if I can get this to work, though. Here, can I? I'm clicking on what looks like my... Uh, so, somebody show me what to click and I'll click it. I, I was trying to click on what looks like my chapter. 
You can just use there. Okay, really thank you very much. Is that up there? Good. Um, so you see the title. That's uh, did that count as my time, Martin? Um, <laughs> So this, this chapter where Bo Host is, is co-authored with Jim Lapsley, uh, Jim is um, really a remarkable uh, researcher uh, a, a, here at the University of California, which has been a sidelight career for him mostly. He's an historian, uh, and I would say the premier historian of California wine and related topics, and you, that flavor comes through this chapter. It, it, we really do take a, uh, a, a historical approach. Jim, unfortunately, is stuck in St. Helena today poor fellow, um, hard at work doing what he does. Um, and, and in addition to uh, the, the book we're celebrating today, we'll try to sell a few copies of Martin's book, but I also want to sell a few copies of Jim's book, a famous uh, history of the Napa uh, Valley called Bottled Poetry. And th these are just a couple of graphs. of the, we, we really do look at the contribution of the University of California, particularly Davis, but really it's broader than just Davis, in fact. Uh, to the transformation of this industry in Napa, and you see a few historical uh, pictures now. And a, one of the things we do in the chapter is document uh, uh, what, uh, what we call a remarkable transformation. That's what it's really about. And then what was the role of the university? And I don't think we go too far in claiming that the university uh, created the industry. There are lots of things that created the industry, including uh, the, the natural climate and, 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 and the like. Um, I quote an economist there not to say, pay no attention to economists, uh, please, but, uh, but I note that this fellow was actually at Berkeley. Um, <laughs> it, actually, one of the, one of the pioneers of, of ag agricultural, uh, uh, following agricultural industries in California started with the Genie Foundation, which is a group of Berkeley and Davis and Riverside economists, in fact. Uh, back in the 19, uh, I think before 1920, and this was right at the end of his career. He had been evaluating these sort of things for decades and did not predict, frankly, the role of UC Davis in transforming the industry uh, in the Napa Valley. And it took a few years, but there really was a remarkable transformation. And even though it's a small part of total California wine production, Napa Valley is, or Napa County is now 20% uh, of the revenue, and we, know, we all know that. Uh, some of us drink bag-in-the-box wine out of the valley here. Some of the rest of you, of course, drink Napa Valley wine uh, and recognize that it's 4% of production and 20% of value. Here's that value transformation, and I've got uh, two things on this chart. Uh, one is the percent, uh, uh, the, and, and the other is the value of Napa Valley grapes measured in millions of dollars. And uh, basically, Napa went from wine's important, uh, to wine is uh, really the whole economy of, of, of that area. Even when I was a kid, uh, there was lots going, there was prunes in the middle of Napa Valley, and that's not true anymore. Uh, so the title, We're Both Hosts, uh, doesn't refer to bed and breakfast uh, in Napa Valley. There are plenty of those too, and if you think about the effect of science and technology on an industry, you also want to think what that industry does to tr transform the rest of the economy, and that's uh, not the subject of our chapter, but it's something that we should be aware of, and if we were calculating the total value in, a, in the way some economists do, we would count that broader spillover sorts of effects. But here, of course, our, our, our uh, nod is to the biological context of, context of hosts, and it really does play to this symbiosis between the industry and the university back and forth. We need each other, we rely on each other, and, and we learn from each other, and I think that's uh, uh, something that we really illustrate in our chapter. Um, the, the, uh, again, we don't contend that the university is all there is. What, what the university did contribute was new knowledge uh, that was used by individual farms, by industry associations, by experiment station uh, people located in Napa Valley, by extension people, really throughout. There was, there was also not only an outreach effort by the university explicitly, there's an outreach effort within the university, I mean, excuse me, within the industry. And it's that linkage into these networks. And people really have to know each other and trust each other uh, for that to happen. And, and we claim and document that that did happen. And lots of the documentation, documentation in this chapter, it really comes from talking to people, just talking to industry leaders, people have been there for a long time, 
how do they view the industry? How did it change their business? So there's lots of that kind of documentary evidence in this chapter. One of the really interesting stories, I think, um, is the old Oakville Field Station, which was begun in 1947 with a gift from the industry to the university. 20 acres right in the middle of the Napa Valley, uh, not worth then what it's worth now, but, but a valuable piece of property even then. A few years later, USDA, which had a research station right next door, said, I don't know if they said it in this, this phrase, but basically they didn't know what they were doing. They, didn't, they couldn't make use of their property. They recognized the university could. They gave their property to the university as well. And that has, been, has paid, uh, we think, remarkable uh, dividends, um, not just with biological technology, uh, new clones, uh, which, variety, which, which varieties are adapted where, but things like mechanical uh, technology as well, irrigation, and techniques that you could never patent. How do you patent uh, this is the way you ought to think about pruning this kind of variety in this kind of climate? So there's, so there's a whole range of biological clones that may be adapted. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of processes that would be very hard to show up in, in a piece of technology. Even irrigation management may be tied to a particular kind of drip or a particular kind of sprayer, but it was really the idea of using those technologies to, 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 to limit irrigation water, for example, to, to change the character of wines. All of that was crucially important. Uh, it was not all easy and it was not all a success, and I think w we highlight in the chapter a very famous case where reliance on Davis proved to be problematic. The famous case, uh, Davis uh, uh, scientists uh, didn't develop the AXR1 rootstock, but certainly helped it spread, uh, convinced people, I think is not too strong a word, that this would be a successful variety, would improve yields, it made farming easier, everything was great, except it didn't turn out to be resistant to the most devastating disease the industry could face. A phloxera took over the Napa Valley. A whole lot of vineyards had to be replaced over a 10-year period. They were replaced. Devastating costs, but that's not the right word. Just that high cost, but not devastating, because it turns out at the end of that decade, people in the industry were saying, they weren't quite saying, gee, we needed that, but they were saying, we have recovered from this and, in fact, are reaching new heights, particularly in quality. And, and part of it was vineyards that would have been replaced over a 20 and 30 year period were replaced in a much shorter time span, shifted, for example, to Cabernet Sauvignon from varieties that were less well suited, that were, that were going to be lower prices. And, and the industry came through that really healthier than ever. I will not claim healthier than they would have been if that wouldn't have happened. That's too much to claim. But they certainly came through uh, uh, it, it's a, uh, in very he healthy uh, stead. Um, we talk a lot about uh, the, um, the research contribution of the university. Um, the specialized education is equally important, and that uh, has involved uh, formal out outreach programs, county extension that is not specific to Davis, but UC-wide run out of the office of the president. Uh, it relied also on university extension, which is a separate system, UC Davis extension. Uh, uh, focused on wine efforts and grape, grape growing efforts, hundreds and hundreds of people taking short courses here, here at Davis and, and in the Napa Valley. Uh, we quote, we find some data that shows that people, that 80% of the wineries claim, we don't know, they claim that, the very fact that they're, they want to claim they have a Davis winemaker tells you something, doesn't it? Uh, and that's what they were claiming. Uh, some people say both, by now, it's the old guys and the young guys. They're all trained at Davis. And, and that's a really remarkable statement about the industry. Uh, so what we claim is that there was a set of innovations, the active effort to spread those innovations, the education base within the industry to take advantage of those uh, uh, innovations, all relied um, heavily on, on the contributions of UC Davis and the University of California. This is not a picture of Napa Valley. Though Napa County is about um, a, a few hundred yards just uh, uh, to the right of this, this is the valley that I grew up in. If you drive, if you f could go through that hill exactly six miles, you'd arrive in Napa due west. But this is the, a little corner of Solano County. I was telling somebody earlier, this is about uh, 
500 yards and $500 a ton from the Napa County line. Set a tough standard there. I, I just want to share with you a few observations of this excellent chapter. It really is a great case study. And I think it's important to recognize that this is one, one example, one case study of 150 years of agricultural research, education, and outreach that has been involved with regional growth and transforming rural communities and the whole food system. So this is one case. A couple of the questions I had was, what about the rest of the wine industry in California? What impact has UC Davis and the public universities throughout the state of California? Because it's not just Davis, it's Fresno, it's Cal Poly. It's a very vibrant public university system throughout the state that has impacted this grape industry. So what, what was that, what was the picture, how does that look as we take a look at it? What I think is really important in this chapter is it focuses on the wide range of impacts that a, univer a public university can have. Its applied research is certainly critical. Its fundamental research is critical, as, as was illustrated. Its outreach and edu its educational program, both the formal for the training and education of the next generation of producers, of educators. What about the farm advisors who are on, on site providing practical applications? What about the demonstration farm. Basically, Oakville served as a demonstration farm for new practices and, 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 and so on. What about that informal network that Dan suggested? When you have 80% of all of the vineyards in the valley claiming that their winemaker was trained and educated at, at Davis, perhaps that may be the most important impact that we have had in, that, in the valley. So looking at the wide range of ways in which a, uni a public university can impact regional development, what is the balance? What are the key points? If you, wanted to, if you wanted to change the mix of impacts, how would you develop an overall strategy for a public university to use its knowledge base, use its research base to really have the maximum um, regional impact and, and national impact? And in the wine industry, worldwide impact, because the partners stretch far beyond the state of California. Our partners now in the wine industry are in Bordeaux, they're in Adelaide, they're in Stellenbosch, they're in Santiago, Chile. So a lot of this is focused on regional, and I think that's really critical. But what are the longer term and worldwide impacts of the kind of work that the, that the university does? What about the role of public policy? Um, it doesn't really come out in this chapter, but obviously it had some major impact. Of course, the most dramatic was prohibition itself and how that transformed what could be done and how it produced uh, a new industry. Um, what about the federal research? I think you alluded to the critical element. That didn't surface quite as directly, but it was there. The fact that, that USDA and its federal research system wasn't functioning very well in Napa Valley and actually turned the farm over to the university is another dimension of this. The one-way street is a really interesting question. And I don't think that that really, I think you were quite correct. Particularly in this case, it was not a one-way street. It was really a partnership. And finally, I'd be really interested in who your resources were. Who were your key informants? Uh, a, a, better, a better sense of the composition of your key informants. The, the uh, interviews were marvelous. Um, what did the university scientists think about this partnership? Most of the, most of the respondents were industry people. Some kind of, kind of overview of who the respondents were and what kinds of questions did you ask them? What was the structure of your, of your interviews? Was it open-ended? Did you structure it in any way? Uh, what were the kinds of key questions you asked? That's my methodologist coming out in me. Uh, but I'd be interested as well in just how you constructed your view of this industry. But well done. I encourage you all to read the chapter. So, so Bill and Dan, why don't we have questions now? And maybe, Dan, you'd like to answer a few of Bill's many questions. <laughs> we have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. 
Right. So the first thing I'd say uh, is, is Bill's exactly right that uh, uh, we could have written this uh, uh, chapter about Fresno County as well as Napa County. Um, and, and the wine industry in California has, uh, has developed uh, remarkably over this period where Napa Valley developed. Uh, and, and in the rest of the state, it's also a matter of, of vastly improved quality of, uh, of grapes and the wine made from those grapes. And, and uh, in those regions, say the Central Valley, the South Central Valley, uh, remarkable changes in yields as well. And, and yields per acre is something people often measure. These days we talk about yields per acre foot, that's yields per unit of water used, and just a real remarkable transformation there as well, really statewide. With the University of California at Davis and the other campuses uh, at the center of, of uh, a, a transforming wine industry, and we could have written this chapter about the almond industry or the pistachio industry or the rice industry, frankly. Uh, e each of those would have made uh, similar kinds of studies. Uh, the, the one thing I'll say about uh, methodology is Jim Lapsley happens to know absolutely everybody in the wine industry. Uh, I will mention somebody to him and he'll say, oh yeah, well he took my short course in 19 whatever, or uh, yeah, we, did a, we were on a program together or yeah, I was a wine judge when his uh, uh, wine came in uh, with a silver medal. Or, or so, so uh, a lot of uh, the interviewing here were people that uh, Jim had had contacts with before, and and from people in in the viticulture and enology department, uh, longtime faculty members or even emeritus faculty members. We did not spend much time talking to people here on campus. So it really was trying to get. What, are the, what, did, what does the industry perceive as the contributions as opposed to what do the scientists uh, perceive as the contributions? Uh, the last thing I'll mention is a study we currently have underway. Uh, I would say finishing because I promised I'd finish it this week uh, while Jim's hanging out in uh, St. Helena, uh, is, a, is a study of specific case studies, not of a location, but of technologies that we're doing with people in the viticulture and enology department right now looking at the spread of Chardonnay, the Chardonnay variety in California, looking at uh, some uh, assays uh, for figuring out uh, 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 the causes of cork taint, for example, and, and another uh, tannin um, assay uh, to help uh, winemakers uh, in the process of making red wines. And then we're also looking uh, prospectively at some uh, technologies that are really right on the edge of improving variety, uh, varietal developments for improving water use efficiency, uh, both really throughout uh, 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 wine grapes. So these are technologies that are currently, or there's a whole range of historically important technologies to things that haven't yet been adopted that we're uh, evaluating, again, not in a formal e economic approach, there'll be a bit of that around the edges, but mostly in, in more of a historical approach to well, how is the industry uh, transforming? So the case study we did looked at the last uh, uh, 40 or 50 years, uh, but we could have been thinking instead about the next 50 years, and it would have been a somewhat different chapter. But everything we described in this chapter is, is continuing. And I suspect that's true for all the other chapters in, in this book. Yeah, over here, and then we'll get... So one of the questions the discussant asked was, you know, why just Napa? And so let me just ask, maybe more pointedly, why is Napa still so different today? Because I get the impression from your chapter that it wasn't true maybe 50 years ago or 60 years ago. So is it because of the technology from UC Davis? Is it because of the climate or the soil? Is it because they went up market because their land got so valuable that they had to go to sort of up, more upmarket targets as opposed to, say, Lodi, where they go fairly down market. I mean, why is it that Napa, is it marketing? I mean, why is it Napa has such a separation between it and the other wine-growing regions of California? Yeah, good, good questions. Uh, uh, the short answer is nobody knows for sure the answer to any of those questions. But what, what, first, there is, there is a continuum. And that continuum uh, uh, probably starts at Napa at the peak. Uh, there are a few vineyards here and there in the rest of the states that are, that are nearly there. And then uh, the north coast through the central coast. There, and and 
uh, ending in Kings County or so, if you think about the price of grapes or the price of vineyard land for that matter. Uh, Napa's different, uh, the North Coast is different than the Central Valley for, for well understood, not understood by me, but well understood by the specialists, uh, climate and, and soil types and things like that. I mean, people know that uh, certain kinds of grapes do well with the breezes coming in off, off the bay, for example, going north through the valley. The fact that it's a north-south running valley and allows the coolness in the evening to come through. People can explain these, uh, these things that are going to affect the quality of grapes. Uh, we know that um, uh, before Prohibition, uh, the Napa Valley had some very fine uh, grapes and some very nice wines being produced. And it was coming back to that tradition that they needed some help with. So yes, the Napa Valley changed. Its character uh, was to move upscale. I would say uh, land values went up be because they went upscale, not the other way around. So we, we want to get the causation there. You know, these days where, where people also like to live there, you know, you have to be a little careful about uh, real estate values. And lots of us have worked on uh, farmland prices, and Napa is a bit of a special case when it comes to farmland prices. But some of the same principles apply. Um, is it marketing? Partly, and, and that's part of the, the genius of what happened in the Napa Valley is, is to let people know. And of course, there are um, 100 regions around California and 1,000 around the world that think they're just as good as Napa Valley if people only knew. Uh, and uh, that little corner of Solano County that I, I pointed to, some of them occasionally get that pretension as well. But uh, the market hasn't yet said so. It has said so about little pockets here and there. Pinot Noir in parts of Santa, Santa Barbara County, for example. Um, so so um, it, one of the interesting things uh, that many of us are paying attention to is as climate changes gradually over the next uh, uh, decades and centuries, that w we know that uh, wine grapes can be sensitive to that. And will that change the nature of, uh, say, Napa Valley? Will it mean that Napa Valley becomes suitable for somewhat different grapes? And if you have a uh, a reputation established for Cabernet Sauvignon, does that mean you'll have a hard time transferring to a grape that becomes more suitable for the region? Or will people uh, not notice that the Cabernet is not quite as good, and if they'd only drink Syrah to take a, a, a grape at random uh, from Napa, that would be even better? We don't know yet. We don't really know how much the role of marketing really plays here in this sort of long-run evolution of the industry, not, not for a particular brand of a particular wine, but the sort of bigger questions that we're asking uh, here. Just one thing that I noticed in reading the chapter was that um, the disaster that struck the industry, it, it struck the primarily the, uh, the dominant grape, which was Chardonnay. They replaced it with a high premium Cabernet, which is the premier grape virtually around the world. That's the one that gains the largest value, the, the five premier grand uh, crews in in France or in Margot and Latour and so on, um, and Napa was particularly well suited for that particular grape. So when they re when they hit this crisis and they had to think about what they were going to replant, they did do that. But I think Dan is quite correct. There are a lot of theories on why it happened. There was a question here, and then we have one back there. We'll get to you, Martin. But I. So uh, my question is about the, the crisis in the 1970s when this uh, rootstock that uh, uh, UC Davis scientists thought would be safe instead got hit by the philosopher. So the question is, how did you guys manage to mend uh, that disaster? Because, I mean, one would assume that, I'm just thinking aloud, suppose uh, Cornell had uh, a, a campus in uh, Santa Rosa uh, that could have been the end of the relationship between Davis and, uh, and Napa Valley. So, so whether the, the geographical specificity, meaning the, the proximity of, of uh, Napa and, and UC Davis, actually worked also not only to create this interesting, you know, acad you know academic industrial ecology, but also to kind of uh, control, in this case, the damage. Uh, anyway, I'm curious to know how you meant it, because that, that looked like a measure. Right, and, and I may turn that to the sociologists, but, but uh, I will say this, uh, and, and uh, uh, Bill referred to this a minute ago, uh, this 150 years, or here at Davis, 100 year, or more than 100 years of, of um, 
close working relationship builds a kind of trust that that you just can't doesn't come out of nowhere and and so that uh, people understand when there's an honest mistake they uh, there was uh, it wasn't hey trust me plant this variety or, or this rootstock it was here's the reasons here's the thinking we have uh, we've done these trials it seems to work we recommend it and people trusted that and when they found out that it it had a serious problem I think the university was pretty forthright about it. You know, they were in, naturally individuals. Gee, it's not my fault. It's that guy's fault. You know, everybody does that for a little while. But I think the university was pretty good at saying, here's what you have to do. Here's the trans transformation. They were right back out in those same fields helping people identify the disease. And given this long history of, of close working relationships, and it's not u unique to wine, uh, this in fact, it, it, the fact that it's not unique to wine is probably also useful. You know, the farmer uh, down the road that was growing prunes and the cattleman in the hills also has that relationship with UC Davis. And so there was this, this sort of deep underlying trust that, that I think was the, the crucial factor there. That and a, a certain amount of openness uh, was enough to do it. I think I would definitely concur with that. The social network, the idiosyncratic credits built up over decades of collaboration. And that network included not just the farm advisors, but where they were educated, and after they were educated, who they turned to when they had problems, um, and the history of being successful. When, going back to the earlier question, when the French evaluated the California wines, um, four out of the top five U.S. wines were in Napa Valley, and the fifth one was from California. I think it was Ridge, Ridge Wine. Yeah. But that set a tone as well. So there are a variety of factors. And there was a question on, yeah. We are two minutes left. So. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about an aspect of the two-way street that you sort of touched upon. So a lot of it is about what we've contributed to development of the wine industry in Napa Valley. But as we try to replicate those kinds of successes, I think one area where just starting to become more aware of is the um, value of the either the people we train and how they create a critical mass that feeds back into then how we do our business here on campus. I mean, and that's a little bit more based on those kind of either we create, in this case, we have a cadre, a large number of alumni who have a common experience and warm feelings to Davis because of their common experience. We don't have that in, in other fields that are much more diffuse. But, um, but we obviously want a two-way street because we want to be able to hear from industry about what they think priorities are that we should be tackling. We want to be able to be training people that are relevant. We want to be able to, to foster a critical mass of industry growth that creates the kinds of Napa Valleys or Silicon Valleys in other fields where it takes that critical mass. I don't know if you could talk a little bit more about that. Right. The, uh, let me say first, uh, the idea of, of, of alumni is an important thing to think about. I always remind myself that Robert Mondavi went to Stanford. Uh, uh, but, but he, you know, you just have to walk around this campus and, uh, and you know where his loyalties were and why. And, and he tells that story and told that story uh, quite well. Um, so, so this kind of interaction, you can create alumni, so to speak, or, or people that are loyal to, to your work by, by doing work of value. The other thing, uh, of course, those of us that do uh, work related to agriculture know that whether we're dropped in uh, Seoul, Korea, or Beijing, China, or pretty much anywhere on the planet, uh, we're going to have a cadre of UC Davis alumni all around us uh, saying that whatever is going on, agri particularly agriculturally, which is what I know, uh, uh, whatever transformation is happening in that in that part of the world, there'll be UC Davis people right at the center of it. Uh, and, and so there is this uh, uh, cadre of sort of loyal colleagues uh, really all over the world uh, for, for the kind of work that, that we do here. And I think that's, uh, that's something we're, we're always going to draw on. Uh, the, the, um, I don't want to generalize very much past uh, what we do in this chapter, but I do think that there are lessons here for 
uh, the mission of the land grant university that that uh, at least partly started within agriculture and has broadened beyond that uh, from from uh, the sciences to the to the social sciences to the humanities where we stay engaged with uh, lots of people that are off campus and the idea that we ha actually have University of California employees in every county whose job it is to, to, to do what they can to help uh, spread knowledge and, and information and, and outreach is, is really a remarkable uh, statement of, of, of foresight uh, that, as far as I know, is, hasn't been well duplicated anywhere else uh, really in the world. I would only say I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that Cooperative Extension has played a critical role, it's expanded its role, but it's under, under duress. Okay. So next, uh, we're going to get Christophe Lecouillet from, from Paris to speak with us. Christophe uh, will join us via Skype. He received his PhD at Stanford and is currently a professor of the history of science and technology at the Université Pierre et Marie Curie. My French is terrible, sorry. Sorry, Christophe. Um, he's the author of numerous articles and two very important books on the development of the uh, Silicon Valley and the semiconductor industry. It's no exaggeration to say that he is the foremost uh, historian of the Silicon Valley semiconductor industry. His paper, Semiconductor Innovation and Entrepreneurship at three University of California campuses, will be discussed by uh, David Hodges, the Daniel M. Tellup Distinguished Professor Emeritus, I believe, of engineering. I think we left off the emeritus. I'm going to put him back to work. Oh, I've been left it off here. Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Sorry. I left it off here uh, at UC Berkeley. Dave is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the recipient of too many awards and honors to, to list it in the short time I have. Dave Hodges is a truly special engineer because he's always taken the time to talk to us historians and social scientists. All right, it's really amazing. You send him an email and ask him a question, and he answers it, and you go, oh my god, I didn't know this. Uh, so uh, I can't speak enough for his willingness to reach out to those of us on the other side of campus. Uh, there are two chapters in this book that benefited immensely from his willingness to answer the author's questions and introduce us to the right people. Dave, Maori, me, and Christophe can't thank Dave enough or give him enough kudos for his, uh, his wonderful academic career. So with that, I will turn it over to Christophe and then Dave will be the discussant on the paper. Okay, I should be able to hear you. Is it working now? Can you see my slides? Yeah, thank you. So thank you. Thank you for having me so from so far away. Is it working now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Okay. So thank you for having me some from, from so far away. Um, I would like to say a few words about my chapter on uh, semiconductor research and innovation and entrepreneurship at three campuses, uh, namely uh, UC Berkeley, uh, UCLA, and uh, UC Santa Barbara. So uh, what I try to argue in, in the chapter is that these uh, three campuses uh, made a very significant contributions to the uh, semiconductor industry in California, so in three ways. First, by uh, innovating new technologies, also by uh, forming new firms, and in the case of Berkeley, uh, through the creation of a new industry, namely the electronic design automation industry, this industry that uh, develops the software required to uh, design new chips. Um, so the second argument in the chapter is that these uh, very substantial contributions were uh, predicated on the building of very close ties between these campuses and major centers of semiconductor innovation, namely Silicon Valley, of course, but also the cluster 
uh, around Los Angeles and the cluster doing compound semiconductors around Santa Barbara. And uh, what I try to show uh, in the chapter is that research groups at UC use what they learned from industry, uh, their insights on where the technologies and industries were going, uh, to make uh, important technological innovations. And then these groups later transferred their technologies to industry through uh, technology licensing, but also through faculty consulting, the placement of students, and the formation of new firms. Um, another uh, key argument of the chapter is uh, to show that each of these campuses, namely uh, UCSB, UCLA, and UC Berkeley, went after semiconductors in very different ways. Uh, each uh, specialized in a different type of semiconductors. Uh, each campus developed different ways of transferring uh, knowledge and technologies uh, from uh, the university to industry, and also each campus uh, develop a, a different style of entrepreneurship. Now, uh, develop more uh, of that in the next few minutes. And uh, what I try to show in the chapter is that these different approaches at the different campuses were shaped by the technological interests and, and values of key faculty members, but also, and, and importantly, they were shaped by the different environments in which these campuses were located. And these campuses were located indeed in, in very different environments. So Berkeley being uh, close to Silicon Valley, uh, UCLA being uh, closely linked to this cluster doing semiconductors and different systems in Los Angeles. And then there, were this, there was also this important tie between uh, UCSB and firms doing uh, compound semiconductors in uh, Santa Barbara. So first, I would like to talk about Berkeley. So Berkeley did the most of its uh, close uh, uh, pro its proximity to Silicon Valley by uh, focusing on silicon microchips, this, this technology at the very center of Silicon Valley. And since the early 1960s, faculty members and students at Berkeley have been working on manufacturing processes to make microchips. They developed uh, numerous types of chips, um, uh, including in communications, and they also design uh, software that is required to uh, uh, design the chips themselves. And uh, what I try to show in the chapter is that this work on processes, uh, chip design and chip design software was really based on transfers of knowledge and know-how from local firms such as Fairchild, HP and Vidar, but also from the Bell Labs. And it's on the basis of these transfers that uh, Berkeley faculty and students made very substantial innovations in semiconductors. So there are, I mean, I would like to talk about two of these now. Uh, one is mixed uh, signal circuits. So these are circuits that uh, can process both digital and uh, analog signals. So these circuits were really pioneered by Dave Hodges and Paul Gray um, at Berkeley in the 1970s. These circuits were then uh, commercialized and manufactured by firms in Silicon Valley, uh, such as National Semiconductor, and Intel, and uh, these circuits proved to be very important as they help uh, digitalize the telephone systems. Uh, the second uh, locus of innovation that I would like to talk about is uh, the software that is required to simulate and also design the microchips. So this was also a center of uh, much activity on the Berkeley campus, um, around Don, Don Peterson and other faculty members uh, there. And this led, and what's uh, inter interesting and unusual about this program is that faculty members uh, doing that sort of work at Berkeley were very interested in distributing their software freely to any group interested in using it. Uh, that was one way of basically diffusing uh, the work done at Berkeley. Uh, the other way uh, that they did so was by establishing uh, firms on the basis of the technologies that they have developed at Berkeley, and I think about especially two firms that proved to be very uh, important for the history of Silicon Valley, uh, namely uh, Cadence and a synopsis. The story of UCLA is very different. The story of UCLA is really the uh, history of uh, technology transfers coming from the defense industry in Los Angeles to UCLA. Okay, so in the 1980s, uh, large firms such as, such as TRW uh, were actively involved in the design of broadband circuits for the military. Okay? And these technologies developed at TRW were then transferred to UCLA by a young faculty member by the name of Henry Samueli. 
Okay, and in the uh, late uh, 1980s, early 1990s, Samuel Lee and his group at UCLA further developed these technologies developed at TRW and oriented them towards uh, commercial applications. And in 1991, uh, Samuel Lee started his own firm uh, by the name of Broadcom to commercialize uh, his designs of broadband uh, chips. So as you know, uh, this firm uh, grew very quickly in the 1990s and is now uh, the, one of the 10 largest uh, semiconductor firms in the world. So in many ways, UCLA brought these technologies coming from the defense industry in Los Angeles and uh, uh, created a new industry there with these technologies, namely the uh, fabulous semiconductor industry in Los Angeles and in Orange County. So the first case that I uh, uh, investigated in the chapter is the case of UCSB. And there, it's a story about compound semiconductors. So what is a compound semiconductor? A compound semiconductor is a, a semiconductor that is made, that is made uh, of two of, of, of more uh, chemical elements. So one can think of gallium arsenide or gallium nitride, for instance. And these uh, uh, materials, these compound semiconductor materials, are used mostly for uh, the production of LEDs and lasers, for instance. So the story of Santa Barbara is the, the story of a emphasis on compound semiconductors. Uh, the strategy of, um, of developing compound semiconductors in Santa Barbara came mostly from Herbert Cromer, so a, an applied physicist who later got a Nobel Prize uh, in physics uh, for his work uh, at Varian and, and, and also at uh, UCSB. And um, uh, Cromer was an industrial scientist and brought many uh, experts uh, in compound semiconductors from industry, from Hughes, from uh, Rockwell, from HP, from the Bell Labs, and also from uh, a Japanese firm, uh, Nichia Chemical, which had uh, strengths in uh, gallium nitride LEDs. And it's on the basis of this uh, expertise coming from industry that faculty members um, and students at, um, at UCSB developed new types of compound semiconductors. They also fabricated new types of lasers, uh, LEDs, and switches. And then they uh, patented this work. And interestingly, most of these uh, faculty members uh, also started firms that uh, license technologies uh, that were owned by uh, UCSB. And most of these uh, startups were uh, in Santa Barbara, but some of them were also in Los Angeles and in Silicon Valley. So, in conclusion, I would like to go back to the main question, what did uh, UC campuses uh, bring to uh, the uh, semiconductor industry in California? It seems to me that these campuses brought, uh, made two, made four major contributions. The first one was the training of thousands of very skilled engineers and scientists, okay, who then went to work for uh, firms in California, uh, mostly in Silicon Valley, but also in Los Angeles. Uh, in San Diego and also in Santa Barbara. The second contribution was the development and promotion of experimental technologies that, not, that had, had not yet been explored by industry. Okay, so that's the case of mixing all circuits, the case of compound semiconductors, uh, and also the case, of course, of the software uh, that was developed uh, at Berkeley, and it, it could be also uh, said about broadband circuits at UCLA. And, um, and what these, these campuses did was really to develop these new technologies and pro them, promote them very heavily uh, in industry. Uh, the third contribution was the translation of these experimental technologies into commercial products. So this was done in two different ways. Uh, first, for the uh, creation of new firms. We can think of, the, of, of, uh, uh, of course, of, of Broadcom or Synopsis of Cadence. But interestingly also, these uh, Technologies were translated into products uh, by uh, students who uh, went to industry after finishing their PhDs uh, on the campuses. And also, uh, these uh, technologies were translated into products by faculty members who worked at, as consultants for uh, firms in California, or in some cases even worked as engineers uh, for these firms uh, as part of uh, sabbaticals. And it seems to me that the fourth uh, important contribution of these campuses to uh, semiconductors in California uh, has been the renewal of regional economies. So that's especially the case in the case of Los Angeles, so a region that was really focused on the defense industry um, in the 1970s and 1980s. 
and that uh, then saw the growth of a new industry, namely fabric semiconductors, largely because of input from UCLA. Uh, the, story, the story can be said on a small scale, so for uh, Santa Barbara, okay, so the compound semiconductor uh, uh, cluster in Santa Barbara grew largely uh, because of uh, research done at uh, UCSB. And uh, similar stories could be told also about uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, Silicon Valley was uh, uh, clearly enriched by the research uh, coming from uh, Berkeley, especially in the area of software and electronic design automation. Thank you. Well, Christoph has done a wonderful job of capturing the picture that existed in the 70s and 80s in the uh, UC campuses that he writes about, uh, ca capturing uh, the big picture, the details, and a lot of the spirit. The spirit comes through more clearly if you're able to read the whole chapter, and I would highly recommend to you the after notes, which add a great deal to the main body of the text. This was a unique period. Uh, the electronics industry was making an enormous transition from the vacuum tube era to the solid state, to the integrated circuits, to the very large scale chips we have today. And a lot of things were changing. And they were changing very fast. The old ideas uh, of how do you make a circuit to be a, to be a radio or to be a communicator or a computer had to be reinvented all over again. So we were fortunate to be there at a time when all of this was going on at an enormous rate. A common factor for all three of these is that virtually all but two of the, of the people mentioned by name in Christoph's chapter, about, about 15 or 20 people, all but two of these had significant career-changing experience in industrial laboratories that were working at the leading edge in these new technologies. Bell Labs being prominent, but also uh, Hughes and uh, IBM and RCA and Texas Instruments we uh, recruited faculty people after s typically two to seven years of experience in industry and brought them to university in the midst of this great turmoil in, in the uh, ideas that were being employed to develop electronic systems. Coming from industry, I think, helped a lot because better than a fresh PhD, we had a, a, a knack for picking picking your problem, select the topic for your work in recognition of the limitations of the university environment, in recognition of what's already being done elsewhere, pick your topic carefully. And you just don't get insight into that kind of decision making straight out of a PhD program. We also came with a respect for people working in different disciplines, mostly through the sciences, but the, uh, lab the industrial laboratories employed a mix of, of electrical, mechanical engineers, physicists, chemists, and that was an extremely educational thing, which was not so commonplace in the, high, in the doctoral level education in that era. We also had a, a comfort with peer-to-peer -peer collaborations. I'll say a little bit later about how UC has done a little bit better dealing with that on the faculty side, but it was very helpful to say, no, I'm not going to be a singularity. I know that my colleague who came from another company, from another place, with different ideas and different skills, and the, the teams that Christoph uh, documents in his chapter uh, reflected the diversity of backgrounds of the, of the partners that got together and worked together toward common goals. Also, we had some comfort in industrial interactions because in that field at that time, the conferences were very important, and we all went to the conferences. So we, we knew the people in the other companies, and we were there on an equal footing with them, and we would discuss and question their papers. They knew us, and we went to the university, they still knew us, and they were still friendly. And it was the, the beginnings of the trust, and I think we worked hard to keep that trust. So when we formulated our programs, we tried to part, get the leaders in the particular area we were working in, no matter where they were, academic or industry, most of them were industry, to get them to be our partners in a certain sense. The minimum sense was come to our meetings twice a year and ask us the toughest, we'll give you a presentation on what we're doing, 
why we're doing it, what we expect to achieve, and we want you to ask your toughest questions. And they rose to that challenge. And they came to the meetings and they asked the questions. And what do you know, they, could, they couldn't quite avoid talking a little bit about their own work that they were proud of. We did this all in a very open way. We didn't have any non-disclosure agreements or any patent agreements to sign, nothing like that. We did it in a very open exchange manner. And we got, everybody agreed there was a lot to be learned. And when we later started asking for money, and they said initially, well, what are your intellectual property terms? So we have the UC terms. You can get a non-exclusive royalty-bearing license. So they said, well, we don't want to have to pay for this work again. We're paying for it to support the research. So we said, you can try not to worry about it. Don't worry about it. So we did do a couple of patents. They're mentioned in the, in the text of the chapter. And they did bring a few hundred thousand dollars of royalties to the university over a period of 17 years. Uh, the other returns we got from this cooperative pattern are in the millions of dollars, millions of dollars per year for our programs at Berkeley alone. And they come directly to the programs. They don't go through the filter of UCOP and the <laughs> chancellor's office and everything else. So they come to support the programs that are of interest to those partners. So I think David Mowry's point is quite right, that if you look at the results from patenting and licensing, they are, they're, they're in the vanishing zone compared with the goodwill return on investment we've gotten from our partners. When we have these meetings, we have a really unique venue that can't be provided anywhere else. We can just have an all-day meeting. Nobody has to say anything. We're prepared to do most of the talking. We want your toughest questions. Then they pipe up and say something, but then later on, the people, they don't talk about anymore about intellectual property provisions. What they talk about is how much I learned from hearing the other guy's questions. That was the, the biggest value, that we all got to work in a collaborative way. I have to say that the beginnings of this, uh, you know, that culture got started in the early days when Bell, mostly for political reasons, felt they had to license the original transistor patents very freely. There was nobody blocked from access to those. And that became the pattern in the industry. And then that became an industry of great mobility of people. So the, the knowledge diffused rapidly. And the rather open character and the absence of patent lawsuits as an inhibitor is what really created that explosive growth of the electronics industry of, in the solid state era. So let me just say that the micro and California discovery programs in my eyes were extremely valuable, particularly for the faculty people who hadn't had the opportunity to have the industrial experience. Those faculty people don't feel too comfortable going out and trying to establish the sorts of relationship that I described a moment ago if they haven't had the industrial experience. But micro really incentivized them to do that. They said, look, you can get $20,000 from micro if you can get $40,000 from, from somebody else. I'm using today's dollars. It was less in the early days. Uh, and, and it's a surprising number of these micro-seeded new projects that went on to become very viable contenders for very big DARPA and other federal government grants. So a lot of our biggest and most successful programs were seeded by the micro that got it started in an early way and got it started with industrial collaborators who could bring some, some uh, real-world uh, balanced to the character of the work. Finally, let me say for the matter of collaboration, a lot of universities, you know, the attitude for a new faculty member was sink or swim, you've got to make it on your own. And that's what happened to a lot of people at a lot of universities, that they didn't make it. And Berkeley got started with a good culture with some very wise leadership uh, early on in the engineering side. The physicists were dragging behind us saying, look, collaborations are okay, but when we're doing the faculty evaluations and the promotions and advancements, there has to be a case that documents the contributions that these different individuals made to this joint project and this joint publication. And that training was imbued in deans and associate deans and department chairs as a part of the Berkeley culture, and I think I give the biggest uh, uh, Credit to John Winery, who was the Dean of Engineering actually back in the 1950s. So that's my, my comments, uh, and I'd be very happy to, with Christoph to respond to questions, but I would love to have a bottle of water.
First, David, I would note that actually AT&T was required under antitrust rules to license the patents freely. That was part of the, the whole issue of the 50s uh, antitrust settlement. Yes. Yes. So it wasn't, it wasn't a desire. It was a legal requirement. Anyway, I want to ask a question of both Christoph and David, something I didn't hear mentioned, which is the role of software. Now, admittedly, I'm a software guy, but still, uh, of the universities you mentioned, you know, Berkeley was one of the four top software institutions in the United States from 1960 through to this day, and the other two universities are really not as noticeable in software. So did that role of software play a role in the development of the semiconductor industry, either in terms of leveraging the semiconductors that were created by the, so the uh, um, these universities and their spin-offs, or in terms of creating the tools that allow you to, to make these semiconductors? Because obviously there's a, a role for software both in, in running on the hardware and in making the hardware. So keep in mind, when we were starting in the 70s, uh, there wasn't much in the way of software that was uh, targeted on this job. You people had what they called breadboards. You ever hear of a breadboard? Uh, it was experimental. The verification was experimental. But Don Peterson, who, who uh, was the leader in this area at Berkeley in the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, foresaw this need and started to develop at that time. So the first development was, the major development was the software for analyzing what you've got, called SPICE. And that's pretty much a world standard now. And that was, that was a case where uh, there were disputes uh, with the uh, licensing uh, team about how we distributed SPICE. Now, we distributed SPICE, uh, what would have now been a GPU license that allowed people access to the source code and to reuse the code uh, with proper acknowledgment of Berkeley's original contribution. There were others at the time who, who, who locked it up, and it was all protected, and binaries only were distributed, and nobody else could make any changes. So Don, Don said, no, this, is, this work is being done with public money. It ought to be freely accept, uh, accessible to the public, and the, uh, the Bayh-Dole argument of a, a licensing process being necessary to bring this to the market, that was not a valid argument in this case. So that's the way it proceeded, and SPICE became the dominant tool for analysis. Then the later came the synthesis and so on, which led to synopsis and cadence. And uh, that was done, uh, original research was done at the university, but never to the point of a product. And they were commercialized, developed as products by cadence and synopsis, both of whom uh, uh, became very generous supporters of that program. Uh, Christoph. Uh, yes, I, I would certainly uh, agree with this. The thing that I would say is that the the EDA program at Berkeley benefited from the fact that it was between two parts of the department. On the one side, it was electrical engineering, and the other side, it was computer science. And faculty members, and there was an effort to build these two parts of the department. And the uh, computer and faculty members were working on EDA, were working at alliances on both sides. So that certainly helped the growth of that that group, I think. Yes, indeed. Uh, thanks to both of you for uh, uh, great uh, presentations. Um, I'd be interested in, this, this just came up in you know, your uh, responses, uh, of the, the top five uh, comparable departments in the country, am, am I correct in thinking that only UCB combines electrical engineering and computer science? MIT. MIT does too. Okay, so what, what, what do you see as the the pluses and minuses of that for the, uh, the research and innovation processes that went on during this period of time? So there are pluses and minuses. And uh, uh, <laughs> I think that we've had more joint projects involving serious computer scientists and serious electrical engineers than places that don't have the joint department. We've had more good projects. And uh, the risk, the whole risk uh, computer series, uh, there were three generations of products that involved joint oper joint activity. Uh, the early EDA software was an EE thing, but then the computer science guys came in and made it, made it professional level. Uh, so the, the difficulty is that when you're a very large department and you think about academic governance and you're trying to balance all the elements of a, just a very diverse discipline and say, well, who should we hire this year, right? Then it becomes when you've got over 100 people and they're all in all directions, 
it becomes hard, hard to manage. So uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, so Cornell split a few years back and the, uh, successfully organized themselves now as separate, totally separate. Carnegie Mellon has always been separate. They're very successful. Uh, Stanford, yeah. All the computer science was brought into the College of Engineering at Stanford, whereas at Cornell and at Carnegie Mellon, it's separate colleges. So the, uh, and these are institutions of different character, and those three are private. Uh, I, I can't make, write one prescription. I think you can succeed either way. For the, for the rise to greatness of uh, electrical engineering and computer science at, at Berkeley, how important was Silicon Valley? So if you would have been located in St. Louis, Wash U, great university, could you have accomplished the same thing? So, uh, you know, the, the uh, initial heart of the semiconductor industry is on the East Coast, and there was quite a bit around Boston and MIT. Uh, and there was a lot in New Jersey, RCA, and uh, there was on New York, IBM. And the, uh, the industry got started there. But if you, you know, if it's sort of like immigration populated the United States. The California electronics industry was seeded with a bunch of malcontents who left the East Coast and said, no, we want to do things differently. And uh, so I think there's an element of that. And so I think we were, uh, so we were fortunate to be in, in California at that time when there were very open-minded people who were willing to look at doing things in a different way. Uh, but I, I will say the Bell people came to our meetings and they asked questions and we learned a lot from them. So I, I think that uh, it, it's since the dawn of jet age travel and the, the availability of, of enough money to participate, uh, it doesn't matter terribly. But you've got to have a mindset. You know, if you're in St. Louis, you think about chemicals or something, right? But in California, we, we were thinking about electronics. So, so, my, my, so the, the way I would think about this is that um, what was really critical for the, the rise of uh, microelectronics at Berkeley was the building of the IC lab uh, that really started in 1962. And this IC lab was, um, in order to build that lab, it was essential to get access to manufacturing processes. And these processes were very close by. They were at Fairchild, they were at some of the Silicon Valley companies, uh, well, HP and other places. And, it, it, and, and the group at Berkeley was very skillful at bringing in, in, in these manufacturing processes. And that seems to me that was the basis of the, in the early days of that program. So being close to Silicon Valley was essential just for that. And the, and the story could be told for other things as well, for software and other things. So. I was there. I was one of the first students in that lab. I helped build the lab. And uh, indeed, we had very generous help from uh, Silicon Valley people that would come up, and Gordon Moore among them would come up and give us advice. But what we found the most useful was the very thorough way that Bell Labs had documented almost all the critical process. That was their, that was their culture, and that was their commitment. They did the Journal of the Electrochemical Society, the Journal of Applied Physics had all the early stuff in detail, so you could actually go out and repeat it. And the, none, of the, none of the Silicon Valley guys ever, ever got to writing it down like that. So there's another chapter in this book, as Dave knows, which is the rest of the story of uh, Berkeley's uh, EECS department. And the, the Bell Labs connection during this period, far, far away on the East Coast, for training people for producing technology like the Unix, it is the story that's not told, basically told a regional story in most of this book. Bell Labs was everywhere, I guess, in this time frame. And, and so that part of the story comes out to some degree in Christoph's work, but in the other chapter that we're not discussing today, it comes out really quite strongly. In the 70s and 80s, Bell Labs hired more, more of our PhDs than any other company. And Hughes was second, I think. Thank you.
So, the presentation before the break is University in a Garage, Instrumentation and Innovation in, around, in and Around UC Santa Barbara. Cyrus Modi wrote the chapter, is an assistant professor of history at Rice. His 2006 article in Technology and Culture I still assign to my class, just a, a classic article on the coevolution of probe microscopy and the interaction between the UC Santa Barbara spin-off digital instruments and a university physics lab. Uh, and these are what convinced us that we had to have Cyrus in this book. Uh, since the article, uh, he's written many, numerous other articles and have published a book, Instrumental Community, Probe Microscopy and the Path to Nanotechnology with MIT Press. He's currently working on a new book uh, examining the relationship between changes since 1970 in the structure of the global semiconductor industry and changes in U.S. university government uh, industry partnerships. And we have Mario Biagioli as a discussant, formerly a professor of history at Harvard. Mario is a professor in uh, it was six, seven, eight, nine departments on campus. It's always hard to count, but at least three. Uh, the law school uh, in, the, in the law school and the College of Arts, Arts and Letters. He, he's currently working, uh, let's see, sorry. He's an author of numerous books and articles on topics related to authorship, credit, and intellectual property in science. Once again, there's not a sufficient amount of time to list all of his accomplishments. He is a, a true Italian Renaissance man and has an amazing diversity of projects going on at in, any one time. I think I meet him more in St. Petersburg, Russia than I do uh, here on campus, but uh, we, he will be uh, the discussant of the paper. Thank you, and Cyrus. Thank you, Martin, Dave, everyone. Uh, let me uh, begin way, way back. Uh, so the 1970s were, in many ways, a very dire time for American academic scientists and engineers, part because of the funding environment, uh, almost 15 years of more or less flat funding following a period of dependence upon an explosive growth in funding uh, for the previous couple decades, but also in part because of popular uh, pressure on uh, academic scientists to move toward more uh, applied interdisciplinary research focused on uh, what were called socially relevant problems. Uh, skip that slide. Now, in the uh, UCSB physics department, which is what I will uh, focus on today, the convergence of these uh, two crises, uh, this crisis of legitimacy, this crisis of funding, uh, could be seen quite clearly in uh, rather rapid declines in enrollments, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level in the very late 1960s and early 1970s. In response to this, uh, the department, uh, well, they feared actually that the PhD program could be canceled entirely because of this uh, decline in enrollments. And so in response, they began a new master's degree program, a terminal master's program called the Masters of Scientific Instrumentation Program, which was actually quite successful at recruiting about 10 new students a year uh, from 1971 onward. So when you look at this graph, the graduate student uh, line, from 71 onward, you should add about 20 students uh, to that graph. So you, you can imagine if you subtracted 20, that uh, would be a, a quite uh, a dire line for this department. Uh, now, uh, this uh, d new degree program was uh, very successful at recruiting students on the basis of the opportunity to do self-directed, applied, interdisciplinary projects of uh, what the students considered to be social relevance, often in partnership with extramural organizations like hospitals and schools for the deaf. Uh, pro uh, student projects included things like uh, a tactile sound mixer for an audiophile uh, undergraduate, uh, and a system to help teach uh, deaf and hard of hearing kids how to pronounce vowel sounds uh, correctly. That's on the left here, a somewhat more sophisticated version on the right there. And then also quite a bit of uh, biomedical instrumentation projects, including this uh, blood flow meter uh, on the left. Now, this uh, master's program could have been one of uh, many Vietnam-era institutional reforms that simply petered out after a few years. 
had it not been for the impact of this program on the on and off campus activities of its faculty leader, a guy named Virgil Ealings. Ealings had been recruited to UC Santa Barbara in order to do high energy research, uh, high energy physics research, particle physics. Uh, but as a result of his uh, interaction with these students in the master's program, he uh, quit high energy and moved into uh, doing research on biomedical instrumentation. And over the course of the 70s, he developed a very successful pattern where he would take student projects from the master's degree program, uh, refine and develop them in collaboration with extramural uh, collaborators, often people who had had some previous connection to the master's program, and then serially starts, uh, found startup companies to commercialize uh, these inventions. As a result of that process, he went from being a very, very small time entrepreneur with a little tiny garage lifestyle company that was selling toys for science museums and weird little devices for alternative medicine practitioners uh, in the early 1970s to by the end of the decade uh, being a quite accomplished serial entrepreneur uh, with larger and larger companies, each founded on the profits from the previous company uh, that were selling very expensive uh, uh, instrumentation to biomedical researchers and clinicians. Uh, that trajectory came to a head in 1986 when the physics department rather abruptly canceled the master's degree program, uh, which uh, I think Ealings took as something of a personal affront. And at the same time, Ealings was founding a new company called Digital Instruments uh, in order to commercialize the scanning tunneling microscope designs of uh, one of his departmental colleagues, a guy named Paul Hansma. And that's the story that's uh, presented at length in the second half of this book. What followed was uh, about 13 years, very fruitful years, in which uh, Digital Instruments was really the dominant probe microscope manufacturer, and uh, UC Santa Barbara was recognized internationally as one of the top two or three uh, sites of probe microscope uh, innovation and research. And that, the co-location of those two uh, leading places was uh, by no means an accident. There was very much this kind of uh, fruitful two-way interaction that Dave uh, was describing in the introduction. Uh, the Hansmer Group benefited from the proximity of uh, digital instruments, being able to go over there and talk to their engineers, convince them to add certain functionalities to the instrument that they wanted. Uh, they, and they also benefited very much from digital instruments, gifts of instruments and money directly to uh, the university and the Hansma Group. Uh, and those gifts really amplified the productivity of the Hansma Group uh, in uh, uh, very profound ways. Conversely, uh, digital instruments benefited very much from the fact that the Hansmer Group was producing innovative new designs for microscopes, maybe even more importantly, innovative new uses for these microscopes that were opening up new market areas for DI to sell to. Uh, they also benefited, obviously, from uh, personnel being trained within the Hansmer Group who then moved into uh, uh, digital instruments. And maybe in a more difficult way to trace, they benefited quite a bit from uh, the Hansmer Group's substantial network of collaborators and their uh, perceived leadership in this research field. Uh, now, those uh, two-way interactions uh, were complicated. Uh, in some ways, they benefited very much from Ealing's disgruntlement with and estrangement from uh, UC Santa Barbara partly as a result of an intellectual property dispute with the university in the late 1980s, probably also because of his unhappiness about the canceling of the master's degree program. Uh, Ealings, uh, in the very early 90s, uh, quit his job at the university, severed many of his formal ties with the university, and really created a situation in which the relationships between university and firm could be negotiated uh, in such a way that both partners are really very much trying to maximize their own benefits without <laughs> much interest in each other. Um, now, uh, that situation continued on uh, with ups and downs, but very fruitfully until uh, about 1999, when DI was more or less bought out uh, by a Long Island uh, semiconductor process manufacturer. And uh, in a situation very much like the one that uh, Steve Casper, Casper is going to describe for Hybertech uh, and uh, something that Christophe Lecuyer has described in his history of uh, Fairchild Semiconductor, that new management introduced a much more structured administrative style uh, that led to a, a 
quite a high degree of employee disgruntlement. Uh, many of those employees then left and founded their own startup companies, often companies that um, brought together digital instruments veterans with veterans of the Hansmer Group and other uh, people from UC Santa Barbara. And that's really led to uh, the proliferation of nanotechnology startup companies uh, around UCSB and around the Santa Barbara air, air, uh, airport. Um, most, many of those companies uh, explicitly say that what they are trying to do is to recreate uh, the conditions uh, that made digital instruments so successful in its uh, early years. A lack of bureaucracy, a willing to try stupid solutions when the smart ones don't work, uh, uh, an openness to changing their markets as the technology changes. What, I, what I'd argue is that many of those elements that made DI successful were actually borrowed from this Masters of Scientific Instrumentation program. Several of the key personnel at DI were actually graduates of that program. And what little management <laughs> that DI had was modeled on that of the Masters program. And even the in-house recruitment and training of personnel and things like customer relations at DI were to a significant extent modeled on their analogs within the Masters program. With <clears throat> with, and you get a little bit of a sense of that in the ad on the right, which is from very early, early on in DI's uh, history, where they talk about imaging a sample of table salt out of curiosity. Uh, and this ad was actually put together by a, 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 a graduate of the master's program who uh, went to work at DI. The big difference, though, is that whereas in the master's program and in Ealing's uh, startup companies in the 1970s, the focus was on uh, benefiting civil society, benefiting hard of hearing kids and, and blind people. Uh, now at DI, the focus very much was on uh, working with civilian industry. And you can see here, and this is a very, very early ad from Digital Instruments, where already they're saying that they can help CD manufacturers more efficiently uh, make their product. Okay, so a few uh, takeaways from this. Uh, one is that the upheavals of the early 70s in direct and indirect uh, ways contributed to the formation of high-tech clusters around American campuses starting in the 1980s. Another is that master's degree programs matter quite a bit. We can see this a little bit in uh, Dan and Jim's chapter on wine as well, but uh, definitely uh, one takeaway from this chapter is that we shouldn't just be talking about PhD programs. Another is that disgruntlement <laughs> and estrangement can be drivers of innovation, though I'm not sure how any organization, whether a university or a firm, uh, leverages that successfully. And the a last one is also that philanthropy should be taken into a, any accounting of the contribution of universities uh, to local economies. Uh, since he's retired from digital instruments, Virgil Ealings has given millions of dollars uh, both for nanotechnology research at UC Santa Barbara and also to a number of civic organizations around Santa Barbara, many of which uh, are trying to reform high school pedagogy in ways that look quite a bit like this uh, master's program. Okay, thanks. I'm going to keep those slides up. They look good. Hi, Christoph. I don't know if you see me, but hi. Um, so a quick, so it was a treat uh, to read uh, uh, Cyrus' uh, chapter. Uh, the, the, you know, the fine grain evidence and the smart uh, interpretation. It was great. So I have, a, I'm going to comment on uh, some themes and, and um, uh, there are kind of half comments and, and, and half questions. So the first one is about uh, intellectual property. So intellectual property is a returning theme throughout the chapter, but in ways that don't seem to fit the standard uh, Baidol narrative or at least narratives about why we need uh, uh, Baidol. Specifically, I don't see evidence in your story that patenting was a means to move invention out of the university into the private sector. Uh, what we see toward the end of the story is that uh, Santa Barbara made uh, uh, good money from patent royalties uh, emerging from uh, Hasma's um, uh, laboratory. But it, I don't see evidence that the patents were crucial to get the, uh, the knowledge out of the university to uh, begin with or to seed this uh, innovation ecology around uh, Santa Barbara. The first patent mentioned in your story is by a graduate student and is not conferred to the regents. Good for the students. 
Uh, the first patent controversies are between Ealings and the graduate students, so they're not between the university and him, but it's a kind of a, a intra-departmental uh, uh, little scandal. Uh, formal patenting arrangement uh, seemed to emerge only after 1986, so not after Baidol, but they have to do with Ealings leaving Santa Barbara. So. Uh, when Santa Barbara, when Ealings resigned as a Santa Barbara faculty, at that point, ANSMA starts patenting and Ealings start licensing. So basically it looks like when Ealings was there, the patents were not the issue because Ealings was both, both a faculty and an entrepreneur. It's only after he leaves the university that patenting uh, kick in to formalize rather than to uh, promote uh, the uh, tech transition. Uh, so there is no value of death here and no anti-commons either because Hasma, uh, prior to 1986, when he starts patenting, so prior to that, he gives Ealings his, the specs of his instruments and those are the same specs that he gives to other scientists. So there is no anti-commons created by any kind of patenting because there is no patenting and at the same time, it looks like the fact that Ealings developed this nice uh, business that uh, has given a lot of money to Santa Barbara suggests that, again, patents were not crucial. All right, so uh, is, uh, do you think that this story could have implications for other places? Do you think it's a completely local story or um, it, it's something uh, worth thinking about? Then, um, second theme, resources versus lack of resources. This is something I've uh, I've talked to Martin, I've tried to pick his brain a little bit, and, and um, so I have this uh, uh, ongoing perception as an outsider who has uh, been reading innovation literature, especially about Silicon Valley, there are two ways to look at the, this, this narrative. Either there are all sorts of smart people doing all sorts of interesting things, and that's how Silicon Valley started, or you can say, well, these guys didn't have venture capital because venture capital was on the East Coast. Uh, Tonier law firms didn't give this guy, the, these guys the, the time of the day, so they had to convert uh, ambulance chaser and divorce lawyers into fancy high P law firms. Uh, they didn't have uh, enough uh, critical mass, so they had to collaborate. And they have to move around a lot because there wasn't a lot uh, to go around. Right, so one could create, I think, just reading uh, Martin's uh, collection on Silicon Valley as well as uh, Saxenian, you can, you know, you can, one could say that a great deal of this innovation is, was actually started by lack of resources rather than the presence of resources. So here I feel the same thing. So Ealing says that he's a mediocre physicist. That's a quote. Um, you present uh, the, the development of this master's program in instrumentation as a response to the enrollment crisis in physics, uh, which is uh, obviously widespread, but also it would be interesting to know whether it was particularly dire at Santa Barbara. So w was Santa, ba Santa Barbara trying to make it in the top five, but didn't, and therefore had to go for uh, plan B? And so, and is uh, this very interesting uh, ecology of innovation in Santa Barbara the result of having had to switch to a plan B, okay? Um, so uh, you have uh, also the emphasis on interdisciplinarity that is really an interesting element of, uh, of your paper. Again, inter interdisciplinarity is obviously seen as a, a plus, as a resource, but was in, in this case the, res the result of need that is, you have to go and grab this guy from the history department because maybe you can't convince the guys from physics to come and work with you. So, um, uh, so I would say that perhaps not only lack or need is what propels technological innovation, but that lack of infrastructures and resources sometimes spur innovation not directly in technology, but in innovation in innovation ecologies, okay? So I would like to uh, you know, if you can, I think Martin, I'm not sure that he's convinced, but I'll, I'll tr given the fact that he doesn't talk to me, I'll, 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 I'll direct the question to you. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the regional innovation ecology that you're talking about. So because uh, together with Martin, I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work on uh, uh, immigration diasporas of high-tech people, especially Russian computer scientists. So one thing we see is that 
the Russians who want to go to Helsinki, Helsinki are not the Russians who go, want to go to Lon London, and those are not the Russians who want to come to Silicon Valley. So uh, there are good jobs, but uh, you can also see that those with kids want to go to Silicon Valley, the single ones that want to go to London and work hard, make a lot of money, but also have a good time. And so, so there are typologies that seem to have to do with lifestyle. So here we have a regional innovation ecology around UCSB, and you seem to represent it as fairly stable. I saw a reference to somebody who moves to Colorado, but there isn't much evidence, at least in your narrative, about people moving out. So I would like to know if you think that this ecology is stable and what are the reasons for the stability, right? Or, or even whether this is an ecology that is managing to attract people from other places, from uh, you know, Bay Area, Cambridge, and so on, right? So uh, are these people, is just a job, or is the perception that they can move to other jobs within the ecology because th there is lateral mobility, or they are surfers? Uh, or they like uh, the Santa Barbara restaurant. So uh, w what are the, 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 the other factors that keep people there? And then this is a comment, I think that I really love your description of the back and forth between the Hazma lab at uh, UCSB and uh, uh, digital instruments. The fact that, uh, so, so first of all, it's not, you don't need everybody to be entrepreneurial. You can have a, divi a division of labor. So Hazma is not the entrepreneurs, he's, he's happy not to patent, but Ellings take care of business uh, for him. Um, DI employs uh, uh, the students, the graduates from uh, the physics department, uh, and at the same time, uh, these, these students come trained precisely in the industry that uh, Ealings is, uh, um, is particularly uh, concerned with. So, uh, and then the other things that you show, like uh, uh, Hazma gets getting back instrumentation, Ealings getting back connections with the high-end, you know, physics and being able to, sh you know, showcase these instruments to everybody. So the question is, you also s show that when Ealings instead was producing these toys from science museums, the physics department, the physics students did not go to work for him. So it's only when he goes a little upscale into nano that at that point the students go. So how uh, do you have any uh, comment on how high the perceived quality of this uh, private company needs to be to start attracting, uh, and, and also whether this nice loop that you describe is specific to these instruments. So these are instruments that, because they are research instruments, they are not seen as, okay, I'm going to work for DI, so I'm, step, you know, I'm, I'm stepping down. Uh, instead, I'm going to work on an instrument that is going to help us do science. So, so whether the, 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 the mobility is facilitated by a perception of the high endness of, uh, of, of the products. Thank you. Again, really fabulous paper. So, Cyrus, if you want to answer uh, two of the more <laughs> yes. uh, uh, Let me see. Uh, so, uh, your last one about um, the students coming and whether it's specific to these research instruments. Uh, one thing to note is that um, Ealing's kind of throughout all of these startup companies, or at least the, the last three or four of them, he was hiring a lot of UCSB undergraduates. Uh, so I think, yeah, there might be this cutoff that you're talking about where the, the firm had to be prestigious enough to attract uh, graduate students. But uh, some of the earlier ones uh, and continuing through DI were hiring plenty of undergrads and, and master's students. Um, uh, is the ecology stable? Yeah, so one feature of the master's program is that uh, uh, it, was, had, it was predominated by um, California students because uh, tuition in-state was much cheaper than out-of-state. Uh, so what you see with a lot of the people who graduated from that program is uh, they may have taken jobs away from California for a few years after graduating, but a lot of them came back later. And a fair number of them stayed in the Santa Barbara area working, uh, doing kind of essentially independent inventing as a career in mm -hmm. a way. Um, 
So yeah, it's not a not a hundred percent stable ecology for sure. But uh, yeah, there are a lot of people who stay in the area for lifestyle reasons. Uh, for sure, there are lots of surfers um, uh, in this group. There's lots of outdoor of enthusiasts. Yeah, yeah. And one thing I mentioned in the the TNC article that that uh, Martin talked about is that um, a lot of these people. They really wanted to stay in Santa Barbara and use their expertise, but they didn't want to work, work for the local defense industry. And so DI was a nice way to accomplish both of, both of mm -hmm. those things. Um, yeah, and then the other things, yeah, uh, lack of resources as a driver of innovation. Uh, one thing I would point out is um, uh, the master's program, in a sense, was plan B. But it was plan B in aid of continuing with plan A. <laughs> so plan A was to build up capacity in these prestigious areas within the physics di discipline itself. And uh, UCSB, UCSB physics has been extraordinarily successful at that. You know, they went from being a surfer school department to, you know, world leading in a few areas uh, in just a few decades. This was one particular area when that seemed like, that strategy seemed like it was about to falter. I mean, if they'd lost their PhD program, they could never have done that. Uh, so it was sort of plan B, it was a way of finding alternative resources that were locally available mm -hmm. in a period when uh, other resources were, were becoming scarcer. Uh, yeah, and oh yeah, the patent thing. Uh, so one thing I would say is that um, you know, once, so the patenting does seem to have partly played this uh, role of formalizing the relationship between DI and UC Santa Barbara. And in a way, it actually began to discourage tech transfer because it, it incentivized DI to uh, start patenting stuff that only their people had worked on and their, only their people would be on the patent and to become less and less dependent on patents that were coming from, uh, from UCSB. They, it took a few, few years for them to get to that point, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you can see that trend for sure. So I have a question, is this on? Uh, related to Dave, who just got a phone call, <laughs> which is that I think the uh, EECS at Berkeley was also your students were going, for example, to spice your PhD students. So how much, how much of that for your students is uh, the type of work? So going to a PC firm for your PhD students may not have been so interesting. So I'd like to pick up on Mario's point because I think it's, it's very interesting. There's some threshold in these corporations that are interesting questions for your students. Yeah. And could you, I mean, as a dean of engineering, can you kind of react to that particular point of Mario's, which I think is, is a theme that I see in the chapter that Dave and I did, in the chapter that Christophe did, and to some Yeah, I, I think it's relevant also to, you know, Steve's chapter on biotech, if you Mary's. think of biotech as a research instrument in a sense. And Mary's right? call comes. So I, I always told the students to take their first job where they had the most to learn. Go to, go to the place where you see there's a lot to learn and you'd like to learn. And so they usually went up to one of these labs where they were doing the leading edge work. And uh, I, I said, don't, don't try to do a startup right out of grad school. You're crazy. And so most of them did take that advice. And uh, some of them later went on to smaller companies and were very successful. But uh, I mean, you still got a lot to learn by the, by the time you filed the dissertation. So, so beyond the big labs, companies like Cadence or Synopsys, were they doing cutting edge work that your PhD students would be interested in? Yeah, so what, they did hire some of the graduates right away, and, at both the master's level and doctoral level graduates, and, and that was exciting if you could go right on with your mainstream. If you can go right on with your mainstream uh, research and, and commercialize it, that's pretty tempting. So some, some did do that. Yeah, and it's interesting because the table Joel and I have on UCSD alums who started companies in the wireless space, the vast majority of them went to Linkabit. Yeah. They yeah. started companies after Linkabit. Right. Yeah. They didn't start companies out of graduate Which is school. a very research And that table is in yeah. our... Yeah, our and Linkabit piece. itself was founded by Viterbi and, and uh, yeah. uh, Jacobs uh, after they'd had some other experience. Right, right. No, I mean, so it's a... I mean, what you're saying, I think, is very, very interesting. Yeah. 
how the journey of the, if you will, the inventor or the innovator is, you know, there's a journey there before Absolutely. maybe they do something really creative. Yeah. Uh, I'm a high energy physicist, so I know a little bit. I know you see Santa Barbara situation a little bit better. Uh, in uh, high energy physics, uh, instrumentation is an uh, important part. But in the university system, the people uh, doing instruments often is not being respected, okay? <laughs> uh, because you are a technician rather than you are the intellectual uh, behind. And it caused certain frustration uh, for people like Yelling. And I think the program um, really, it's a, uh, I would say, personality dependent program. That means uh, the program is uh, started because of some of the existing people. And uh, I think the enrollment issue is a, uh, uh, to, perhaps it's a secondary. Enrollment issue is a uh, incentive for the uh, department uh, or the college to approve the program, but it's not the the Result. driver really. Uh, okay, and uh, so you can see this is a uh, this program is really uh, in some ways uh, that time is is known as Ealing Tech. You know, uh, <laughs> that is uh, after he left the program, he also died, and so. Um, it often, uh, I would say it's a, uh, the personality uh, who is involved really play a, a very, very much a, 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 very much a, a, a role there. And in some ways, Santa Barbara is uh, incidental. I mean, even could, could be <laughs> somewhere, but you know, somewhere else maybe the, the academic personnel process is a little bit different, so you have less frustration, maybe. Okay, but I think this this whole thing is digital uh, instruments, really. Him. Yeah, I, if this doesn't come across, digital uh, Virgil Elings has a very strong personality. Yeah. He's a, yeah. an extremely sharp uh, businessman, and. Um, uh, Part of his business practice is to put across a very kind of abrasive presentation of self. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I can well imagine that there were personality conflicts in that uh, department before he began this program. It seems that unique among University of California campuses at Santa Barbara doesn't have the mandate or at least the opportunity to create economic growth the way the other UCs do because of the water and the other geographic environmentalists and, and things like that. So do you have any sense of, of how this would be different if the same sort of dynamic were, were in an area which actually wanted and could sustain economic growth like Ventura County or Orange County or, or you know somewhere else where all this fervent and all these people and all these people didn't want to leave would be off forming companies that might get to be bigger companies in the next Qualcomm or the next Cadence instead of little tiny companies that are limited because there isn't a lot of land and water and, and housing. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some local specificities to this. You know, one is that uh, I think at least part of the reason why um, students in this master's program in the early 70s were doing some of the projects they were doing was in part because of the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. I mean, a lot of their projects were oriented toward uh, environmental monitoring and remediation. Uh, that's the kind of thing that they wanted to do with their careers while also acquiring skills that would enable them to uh, find jobs in a very tight uh, job market. Um, you know, one, one thing Mario mentioned is uh, sort of wider relationships within this uh, regional ecology. A lot of them were from California, but not necessarily from Santa Barbara itself. And uh, many of them got jobs in Southern California, in Northern California, not necessarily in Santa Barbara. So yeah, they were acquiring skills in this funny little program at UCSB, but, but the kind of wider economic impacts of it were, were really throughout the state. Um, just a very quick, uh, Christoph's work on the 
the semiconductors in, in Santa Barbara is when the firms grew to a reasonable size, they actually moved yeah. to the valley. So, yeah. And on the biotech side, because we did some work uh, on uh, spin-offs from UC Santa Barbara, if you did biotech, you also moved, but you moved south <laughs> to Mary's neck of the woods, in uh, the San Diego area. So many of these firms, Digital Instruments was not the case, but many of these other firms would move out, particularly because of problems with middle-level managers. You couldn't pay a middle-level manager enough money so that they could have a home in Santa Barbara. So the executives were fine, but it was the middle. And so you moved to San Diego because there's so many biotech middle managers there at reasonable I mean, San Diego is not reasonable, but reasonable prices. <laughs> relative to Santa Barbara, relative to Santa Barbara and the Valley, on the semiconductor side, again, not reasonable, but again, reasonable uh, compared to Santa Barbara. So Santa Barbara has that aspect of people moving out. But around the scientific instruments, your data and our data show that they didn't move. Yeah. In these other yeah, sectors, so they're, not big they're not big businesses, yeah, outside digital instruments. Well, they sold it for around 150 million, so not huge. Probably had 400 employees, or not even that. I think a little less than that, but yeah. Yeah, not big. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. We'll have a short break, and we'll be back for biotech and wireless. Southern California. Okay, we're going to get started again. <clears throat> Hope all of you have gotten a drink of water, dry throats. Uh, this time in a uh, in a uh, in a session. Okay, so next we're going to have um, Steve Casper, who is um, the Henry E. Riggs Professor of management at the Keck Graduate School, Graduate Institute of Applied Life Sciences. Are you still interim dean? He's the interim dean. He's the interim dean. I've known Steve, uh, probably we met in Sweden at one of Bruce Kogut's uh, shindigs and some, some fjord somewhere. Island in the archipelago. Oh, yes, of course, island in the archipelago. We've got our our Swede here. He, he's a former uh, University of Cambridge professor, and uh, he's one of the foremost researchers on faculty entrepreneurship in the biotech industry. He's the author of numerous articles on, on biotechnology and a book on attempts in Europe to create Silicon Valleys. He may tell us about how those worked out. Uh, more recently, he's compiled an amazingly comprehensive database of on the personnel, patents, and publications of California biotechnology researchers and firms. When we decided to do this book, we just said, Steve is the guy we need to do the biotech, tech, biotech chapter. So thank you very much, Steve. Sean Randolph is the president of the Bay Area Council, and, uh, Bay Area Council Economic Institute a public-private partnership of businesses, labor, government, and higher education in the Bay Area. Sean has his PhD from the Fletcher School. Uh, he, is, he is the opinion leader for thinking about the economic future of the Bay Area region. I mean, he is the person. He knows the Bay Area economy. And his institute publishes just wonderful reports uh, on what's happening in the Bay Area economy on issues of interest to the Bay Area economy. He probably knows more about Bay Area business and the role, role of local universities than any single person. Uh, so he is uniquely uh, positioned to comment on the uh, biotech, on Steve's paper on biotechnology in the Bay Area and San Diego. And with that, let me turn it over to Steve. Okay, if I can get this to work, yeah. All right, well, thanks everybody. I really, really want to thank David, uh, Mary, and Martin for organizing this project, which I've learned immensely from. I really, uh, more than anything else, just the attention to detail and their willingness to entertain 
a kind of a combination of the normal statistics and patents and stuff like that, and I'll show you some of them in a sec, with, a, with as deep as we want to do a deep dive into understanding the history of just what happened and how that history impinges on, in this case, the development of the biotech industry in California. Um, I just want to show one slide with a lot of statistics, and I'm hoping somebody from the governor's office is in the back there, so I can just make a real, we're all on the subtle, we're into subtlety, but a real simple thing is that there would not be a bioscience industry in California without the University of California. Um, it really is a complete, uh, like 99.9% .9 result of various government funding in the universities that led to pioneering research into the molecular biology and, and other scientific bioscience fields that led to the spin out and development in myriad ways of this industry. So, you know, tell the governor we need more funding for the University of California now because that funding really in this case has very directly led to this industry. So, not as subtle as what I'm, everybody's going to say today and I'll go to my subtle academic talk now, but funding equal industry is pretty much it in this case. Um, very straightforward. So, if you look at some of the statistics in this slide, um, this is from, so I worked on the 1980s, early 80s to 2005 for this, for this chapter. And what we have here is just some statistics on output across the University of California. The chapter focuses mostly on UCSF and UC San Diego, but here's a little bit of data from across the state. And you can see that UCs across the board have been influential in the bioscience industry in three ways here, uh, in creating patents that in not all cases, but in some cases, become the founding ideas both for new firms, startup companies, or are licensed to other companies, um, or creating those other companies, or creating P personnel for those companies. So this is the stuff that came out of that database uh, uh, that Martin was talking about. Hundreds and hundreds of individuals have gone from uh, the scientific laboratories of UC labs to become, uh, in this case, senior executives in these companies in California. So in addition to creating the ideas that leads to the commercialization of research, um, creating the companies, the spin-up uh, processes, the University of California campuses have also led to the creation and formation of many of the skills that go into the industry. So a really profound impact across the board. What I want to focus on are some of the differences across two of the leading clusters. So I'm going to focus on San Francisco and San Diego, and I'll just give a precis of the main argument and show you some of the evidence and then conclude, and I can't wait to hear Sean's comments. Um, the interesting thing in California is that, if, and I go, I've done a lot of traveling and I get invited to do cluster stuff quite a bit. Um, in the bioscience industry, there really are only three clusters that really mattered on the world stage today. They're in San Diego, San Francisco, and Boston. Uh, I lived in the UK for quite a while and I was doing all these projects in the UK bioscience industry. One day I kind of tallied it all up and the UK, which is known as having the very best bioscience industry in the whole of Europe, um, their industry, if you look at any indicators, uh, is smaller than San Diego's, that little city down in, in, in you know, San Diego. Um, so these agglomerations are huge in the bioscience area. That being said, these bioscience clusters in California have, have pretty different characteristics and one of the characteristics that I want to focus on today are uh, differences in how companies engage universities. And you can see this in these chart, this chart here, or this figure, which just basically adds up all the publications um, of uh, uh, bioscience companies in, two, in these two regions. And you can just see that San Francisco companies have a whole lot more in San Diego. The interesting thing is that it has nothing to do with the success of these companies. Uh, companies in both regions are very, very successful. But the, the willingness to engage in academic science differs across these two regions. And that's one of the kind of main outcomes uh, we are trying to explain in this chapter. Um, the explanation in the chapter, and I'm just going to give a couple examples and just go through it briefly on this slide, had three parts. So the first part of the chapter, and I was just reading it on the plan again today, and I was like, wow, it's, I actually wrote this stuff, and then David helped edit it. And it's like, this is great. Uh, did I write this? It's like, wow, I wasn't Dean then. I was actually thinking, um, a little bit at least, here and there. Uh, it's a three-part argument. First, um, I look at the scientific activities in the chapter that led to the formation of the formative company in uh, the formative sort of company that kind of got the cluster going in each region, which everybody knows in San Francisco is Genentech, and then down in San Diego it's a company you probably haven't heard as, of as much, but is probably equally important, at least in that cluster, a company called Hypertech. Um, second, um, I look pretty closely at the technology strategy of those companies and how they get involved in, in um, linking or not linking the university research and patterns of work organization that developed in those companies. And then finally, um, the chapter makes an imprinting argument showing that 
In both cases, for different reasons, a lot of senior executives and scientists end up leaving these companies, going to form other, other companies in both regions. Those companies became kind of the dominant sort of access of the early growth of, of both clusters. And because those follow-on companies ended up following very similar patterns of kind of technology uh, commercialization and general organization, they, left, they led to the imprinting of these clusters that leads to some of these differences in terms of things like the proclivity to publish. Um, just to give a really simple uh, preview of the story, and I'll just show you some more evidence and I'll conclude with some implications. Uh, and the first part on engaging science, the, the, the history of Genentech is pretty widely known. It's the history of an incredibly high stakes uh, competition to be the first organization, either scientific or commercial, or nonprofit or commercial, to clone the human insulin gene. And Genentech was formed through this collaboration. Um, through a, a somewhat maverick scientist, uh, Boyer, and uh, Swanson, their CEO, who had a venture capital background, who basically got funding from Tom Perkins from the well-known, uh, very, it was just Tom Perkins in the beginning, actually, but then Kleiner Perkins, the venture capital company, to kind of enter a competition with labs from UCSF, it turned out, uh, Reuters Lab, um, and, and Harvard, uh, Wally Gilbert's lab. And it led to sort of a high science kind of competition where most of the research actually took place at UCSF and down in, in Southern California at, at uh, the City of Hope through funded research in which Genentech was, was sort of born. And it was born out of doing science at the highest levels. And what I argue in the chapter is that the same kind of pattern of organizing science through that sort of competition or race to clone insulin is how Genentech ended up doing science pretty much to this day. I was just at Genentech about three weeks ago interviewing some scientists there and the kind of PI dominated university model that they used way back in the beginning they're still using today. The other company we talk about, uh, Hybertech, the San Diego company, um, <clears throat> it was formed for, uh, through a, a incredibly influential person now in San Diego named Ivor uh, Royston who is a junior professor. He had just sort of shown up at the scene at UCSD. He had, was formerly a postdoc at, at Stanford. He had access to an incredibly important asset though. He was one of the few people that had access to cell lines needed to do monoclonal antibody research. Monoclonal antibodies were developed uh, at the University of Cambridge by Milstein and Kohler. Cambridge rather famously decided not to patent those methods and they just put them into nature so they're in the public domain but it turned out you had to have access to the cell lines to actually do the work. So through a long kind of story of people working with people, um, a guy named Hertzenberg at Stanford had worked in Kohler's lab at Cambridge literally, I guess, packed themselves in a suitcase, brought him back to Stanford. Um, Royston was working in that lab and had access to these cell lines. He had a, a master's level assistant named Ber Howard Borndorf that became one of the leading people in the world of actually replicating these cell lines and using them for, in this case, the beginning cancer research. So not at all born out of a high stakes race like the Genentech case, Genentech case, but at about the same time Genentech was being formed, Bern, uh, Royston had heard about all this got in touch with actually the same venture capitalist and started a company first to create research tools, uh, basically selling these cell lines to other people that wanted them. And then soon after, they, they ended up uh, using this uh, technology to, to do uh, diagnostics research. And a company was born. So very different patterns of creating companies. Companies were created, as I already mentioned, uh, Genentech took a, a very high science approach. If you read Sally Hughes's book or any of the other stuff on, on Genentech, over and over the general kind of impression that Genentech, although clearly out to make money, it was a commercial orientation. In terms of how they did science, they had a university-like atmosphere from the beginning or a PI-centered model. Hybertech, on the other hand, uh, very early on, um, um, a professional manager from Baxter is brought in, and he's a very influential person also down in San Diego uh, named Ted Green. He was a Baxter manager. If you've read kind of Monica Higgins' book on this, these kind of Baxter trained people were, were trained through a rotation program where they learned a lot about how to just manage bioscience commercialization projects and bring things to market. He became head of this company, brought a bunch of his friends from Baxter with him, and they assumed a much more commercial orientation. They did do science and R&D at this company, um, but they didn't assume this sort of, let's make it like a university and see if we can come up with the best university discoveries that would be of high value to a community. Instead, they just tried to commercialize diagnostics projects. So if you look, I have some slides here, and I'm just not going to go through these in a lot of detail, but what, what I did here was just pull up um, the activities of leading companies in both areas. So 
Um, these are all companies in the first slide that basically ended up being managed by people directly or indirectly through Genentech. Um, and what the, the, the data shows here, so these are people in San Francisco, this is just the Saxony and story of people leaving Genentech to start other companies because they could or they were enticed by venture capitalists or whatever. Um, lots of these companies, what they ended up doing more, more often than not was take on a very similar kind of university-like high science sort of technology commercialization strategy that, Gen that Genentech uses. So you can see this, for example, both in the number of publications uh, the number of forward citations to those publications. So if you add this all up, it's about 450,000. And probably most important, just the number of high influence articles where they are uh, authors of articles that got published in Science or Nature. So these are all, you know, talked about in the chapter in more detail as strong evidence of this kind of university-like uh, commercialization structure, which kind of embodies and privileges both a, a let's do science the right way sort of atmosphere in terms of the company, and also strong links with universities. And that's what you see, I'd argue, today if you go to places like UCSF. Uh, if you look at uh, San Diego, it's not like they don't publish and do, and do research. They, they do. Uh, I've looked at a lot of these publications. Hypertech, most of their publications were oriented towards validating, becoming, getting clinical validation of their new uh, diagnostics so they'd be used by doctors. So different types of publications. They're not cited as much. And if you look at that last column, uh, far fewer uh, uh, publications in high influence uh, journals like Nature and Science. It's just indicative of they're, they're doing fine, they're much more commercialization oriented and these companies were actually incredibly successful in, in commercializing products but they did it a different way. There's another slide, I won't go through this one. Let me just talk about some of the implications of the research and I'll finish up. Um, so one thing is just differences in, and I can't read the slide from here, in the early role of the university. Just very, very different roles here. They're both important. So, you know, universities sometimes get involved in actually in this sort of highly, highly kind of fluid, highly collaborative, um, let's, let's collaborate directly with companies or do stuff that forms companies in a very commercial way. Uh, you see that more, especially early on at UCSF than you did at UCSD. Uh, UCSD, how they tended to commercialize science was more of a pull type of, type of thing. It's not like they didn't do great science. The UCSD is, has right now the number one ranked grad program in the biological sciences in the world. Uh, absolutely stellar science there. Uh, but science tends to be done at the campus and in a more transactional view, it's a transactional lens, it's pulled in to the community. So that's the first implication. The second one, again, the technology strategies differed pretty, pretty strongly um, within the companies that came out of these universities. And then finally, the implications for thinking about biotech clusters. So a lot of the research in biotech clusters sort of kind of has sort of a waterfall or spillover kind of logic to it that you just fund the very best universities you can with the very best star scientists, Nobel Prize winners please if you can, and the science from that will just sort of spill over into regions. Um, that, that is what happened at especially the origins of the San Francisco biotech cluster. You had the absolute best science in the world that had clear commercial implications, you know, kind of taking stuff that was really lousy and, you know, using pig, pig source insulin and creating nice, clean, synthetic forms of, forms of it that really would, you know, have, have dramatic medical uses. Um, solving key medical problems and then creating companies that would do that was sort of the San Francisco way. And, and for many of these companies, it's the way it is today. Um, in the San Diego companies, it's not like they weren't trying to do the same thing, but they did it more in an insular lab and the IP would be packaged and pulled into companies. And you see that today. I was down uh, interviewing one of the deans of translational medicine down at San Diego just about a month ago. And I kept talking to this guy about this problem. And he, he, he was saying, uh, I kept asking about, well, you know, some of the local companies, they, they want to set up these master agreements so professors can freely collaborate. What do you think about them? Don't like them. I said, well, why not? It's like, we want companies to pay for access to our intellectual property and our professors from day one. They don't pay, we don't want them to play. Uh, it's a very different attitude, and it's not like they're not doing just absolutely great research at UCSD, but the origin and the genes genesis of that cluster is more on the private side of having really strong entrepreneurial networks that came out of this company, Hypertech, um, that then pulled in the technology. So universities can have different roles, equally useful. Uh, in both cases, science is crucial, but different roles in terms of how they engage within um, lo local clusters. So thank you so much for your attention. I'll stop there, and I can't wait to hear sure, uh, Sean's comments. Okay, right there, right?
thanks, for, thanks very much, Steve. Uh, first of all, it's a great chapter. It's a great book. I, I, I can't resist two really quick general comments on uh, Martin's opening remarks and on the book itself. Uh, the, the finding that the interaction is more important to economic development than the licensing, yes, exclamation point. And uh, the fact that it's a two-way street between industry and the university in terms of the learning process, we, we hear again and again that uh, company researchers working with industry, uh, university researchers get access sometimes to technology and facilities and sort of deep fundamental research that might not be happening in their company. And the university researchers get access to a perspective of how things get picked up and used by industry, sort of the outside world. So there's, there's a mutual exchange that goes beyond the core research. So sort of an exclamation point yes to that point as well. Um, it's a great chapter on biotech, I have to say. I, I know more obviously about the Bay Area than about San Diego, but I, on a personal note, I grew up in San Diego and uh, not very far from where the campus is now. And I remember being very, very, very young, obviously, but being brought by a, a babysitter, this would have been late 50s, early 60s, to some tree out there where the campus is now, around the Ravel campus, and being told someday they will build a university here. But I, I don't know why that stuck in my mind, but I was really impressed with that. And then in high school, would come back and study in the temporary library in what was probably the first building on the Ravel campus that was open to people, and then watching the progression ever since then, the development of the biotech industry in San Diego and the catalytic role that the organizations like Connect have, been, have played ever since in a very long time now, uh, bringing together industry uh, with the university community. And you know, it, it's obvious, but uh, none of that would have happened. I remember Sorrento Valley was weeds and tumbleweeds and snakes. So uh, that it's really uh, completely credited to, to the university. Um, thinking about the chapter itself, uh, you know, one thing that really struck me, which was really well laid out by Steve, is these different models that the Bay Area and San Diego have, have pursued. Uh, the one focusing more on the scientific research networks, the other on pulling the research out of the university uh, into the commercial realm. Uh, and that was an education for me, because working with companies in the Bay Area, I'm used to that first pattern. I thought, well, that's the way it is. That's the way you do it. Uh, and so it was really a, a very, very useful point of information and education to get Steve's perspective on, yes, there are other ways to do this, other ways that can be equally effective, but where, again, the university is really the, the, the core catalyst for, uh, for bringing this about. Uh, thinking about the companies uh, that, you know, there's a ton of examples, a bunch were on the screen. Um, there's one I might just mention only because uh, I know the founder who uh, has served on my board for a while, uh, Corey Goodman, who founded the Exalexis and Renovus. And I think he, he, he's a good case study of, of how the narrative in this chapter actually plays out. Where he was a professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, he first got into this as an advisor to biotech companies on the outside. And the, the chapter documents how that is a process that often happens. And then he goes off the campus, founds Exalexis, founds Renovus, subsequently uh, goes on, on board with Pfizer when Pfizer first lands at uh, Mission Bay. And now is heading his own venture firm, then Bio, where he's serving on the board of some of his portfolio companies. So uh, sort of a classic case. But I think it also demonstrates how in the world of company formation and technology that biotech is really different from IT. Look, in the Bay Area, and I'm, I know this is certainly the case in San Diego, people talk about all the growth of the startups, but it is so fundamentally different when you need to have sort of deep science or you need to have um, the, different, the kinds of facilities that a biotech company requires. You need to be able to make it through clinical trials. You need to make it through years of FDA approvals, it's really different from a bunch of guys or girls, uh, you know, starting, you know, in a dorm room, you know, with their computers coming up with an app. It's just a fundamentally different process, and it's a process that, that, that would not and could not happen without the universities at, at, as an anchor. Uh, which sort of brings me to what's happening today, maybe a, a good example of how this is playing out in the Bay Area 
in Mission Bay, I think everybody's probably aware that, that sort of the Life Sciences District just south of AT&T Park used to be warehouses and train yards. You can't go there today without being struck by how it literally changes uh, week to week, month to month. Things just come out of the ground and remarkable things happening be behind the doors. And, and, and how it came about, you know, so the city of San Francisco figured we actually had this anomaly where we have no biotech companies in the city of San Francisco. Most of the biotechs in the region have come out of UCSF if we think about where the founders came from and where the science came from, or they came out of Berkeley or they came out of both. But when the first in industry started going, Genentech was getting off the ground, the city of San Francisco didn't get it. They just didn't really care much. But South San Francisco said, sure, we'll have you down here in South San Francisco, which was kind of near the airport, and that was fine. So Genentech goes out there, and companies start to be spawned, and they concentrate around Genentech, and all of a sudden, the biotech industry is centered in South San Francisco, and, and the city of San Francisco is looking around saying, what, what, what happened? So, you know, their strategy, very intelligent, was to work with UCSF as UCSF shifts the center of gravity of its campus from Parnassus Heights to Mission Bay. Uh, the city of San Francisco comes up with a payroll tax exemption to encourage biotech companies to land there. The developers of Mission Bay identify the campus as the core and start to identify residential space, but also other R&D space in the periphery, in their zoning around the campus to facilitate and encourage companies to come in and locate adjacent to the university, companies that want access to and regular interaction with uh, the university and, and its researchers. So since then, we, you know, we've seen, of course, the, the, the industry in the Bay Area is still heavily based in, uh, in uh, South San Francisco major cluster over in, um, some of it is in Emeryville, and Berkeley, of course, a little bit in the North Bay. Uh, but really, we've seen sort of the, the spread of it, with the major pull being this gravitational pull into Mission Bay and, and the new campus. So that is also targeting major pharma companies to come in. So when Corey Goodman first uh, started working with, with pharma in the region. It was for Pfizer. Merck has come in now, so it's still a big goal to get big pharma into Mission Bay, and it's starting to happen. But when all this began, again, there were no biotech companies in San Francisco uh, by 2010, and this was like, I think there was one in 2004. By 2010, there, there were 56 biotech companies, most of them located in, in the Mission Bay area. Uh, I think it's also worth noting that the university anchors a number of other not-for-profit research, biomedical research institutes that are affiliated. So the San Francisco Veterans Administration Medical Center, uh, which is actually the largest VA research facility in the country, all of its physician scientists are accredited as faculty at, at UCSF. Uh, the Gallo Research Institute, the same thing affiliation also for uh, the Gladstone Institutes with their principal investigators serve as UCSF faculty. Uh, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine is located just down the street. So again, it, it's this, this anchor for activity, and of course, most of those other organizations pull in a, a very, very large amount of, of, of federal grant funding. So lastly, another way that this has been evolving again with the university as the core is, is QB3 which is one of California four, California's four centers for sci, uh, science and innovation. Uh, and so QB3 is focused on basically quantitative bioscience. It's a partnership of Berkeley and UCSF and UC Santa Cruz, and it's really at the cutting edge of life science and IT, major focus on translational medicine. But what they've done is uh, at QB3, the, in addition to supporting basic research, they, they started early on to think about commercialization. How do you draw out scientists and postdocs on the campus who may have a technology that could be commercialized and may have an entrepreneurial inclination, but it needs to be supported and needs to be drawn out? So the first version of it, the garage, uh, provided minimal basic space. They paid a little bit, but really, really cheap. A mentorship. Uh, people to kind of advise and assist and essentially cut at some point to determine if this idea is going to go anywhere. 
Uh, since then, uh, there are now, this is only in the matter of a few years, there are four QB3 locations uh, and a fifth on the way. Uh, there's two in Mission Bay, there's one in Emeryville, uh, and there's one, uh, one at Berkeley. And again, they're providing lab facilities, uh, uh, incubator facilities. I think the garage in Berkeley has seven startups. Uh, the one in Emeryville has, has 13. Uh, and the, the metrics are, are, are pretty, pretty darn good. If we were thinking about how this flows into the economy, and I've got to look at my notes because I can't remember even my own phone number when I think about numbers. But, uh, so, so far, this is actually as of I think this last week, uh, 80 companies a year have incorporated through QB3 startup in a box program, which is sort of this capsule program about how to start a company. Uh, if you've gone through that program, you are three times more likely to get an SBIR grant uh, than if you haven't. Uh, there are right now 103 companies actively in the QB3 incubator network. Uh, they're generating about $150 million a year in the economy. Uh, last year, so 2013, uh, QB3 companies raised about $145 million in investment. About 125 of that was in private capital. About $20 million was in SBIR and STTDR grants. And uh, last year, QB3 companies filed 57 patent applications. And so the latest numbers are up to this point. Uh, those companies uh, going through QB3 have raised about $528 million, about 500 uh, jobs. And my understanding is that QB3 is helping uh, uh, UC uh, Irvine set up an incubator. I think there may be some discussions over here uh, at UC Davis uh, as well. So it, that just shows how uh, you, can take, you can have industry collaboration on an investigator to investigator basis, but how universities like Berkeley and UCSF and UC Santa Cruz uh, are actually going one or two or three steps farther, identifying uh, funding opportunities, creating incubators, and sort of pushing the envelope often in partnership with cities like San Francisco. Uh, the last thing I would note, and this is more than just biotech, but uh, our institute has been working for a while looking at the economic impact of uh, c people who have graduated from UC Berkeley who have founded companies. And preliminarily, uh, the numbers we came up with were uh, 2,600 firms with 540,000 employees have been, uh, that, I say 2,600 firms have been created that employ 542,000 people. And those are just founded by Berkeley faculty and uh, graduates. If you count indirect jobs, so those jobs that are supported by those core ones, uh, 1.25 million jobs created, uh, more than $230 billion in economic impact. Now, most of that, honestly, is IT. There's a huge IT company, as we could go back to the earlier conversation about electrical engineering, but it does show that at, at the end of the day, you know, this university-based research collaboratively with industry, the movement of people from the university into the economy through various channels uh, is, is a a unique uh, point of economic leverage for the state and, and for the communities where they're located. So Steve, I'm curious because Salk TSRI, um, um, Sanford Burnham, La Jolla Institute for Immunology, they're all in walking distance from my office. And I'm just wondering, have you looked at the character of their science and industry connections? Because it may be that there's more of an activist relationship with industry? I have no idea. I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I, the one I know the best is Salk, just because I've done a lot of stuff there with my students. And some of the professors there, they certainly like, I know Ron Evans, for example, who founded Ligon very early on, um, tend to have more of an activist role. And some don't. What, what I tried to show in the chapter is that the companies that were 
it, what happened to this company, Hybertech, I didn't talk about it, is they had this sort of failed acquisition where Lilly came in and kind of ruined a good company, kind of the similar story that we've heard over and over again. And all these people at Hybertech went out and found new companies. And how they found these new companies was mostly kind of scouring the area for the founding ideas scientifically of new companies. They took in that IP and then they built them up. Several of those companies actually came from Salk Scripts and, and especially those two. So those companies definitely took on that character. But then when you got to like the second or third generation of companies, it became more variable. Um, so that, I think that's a short answer to that. But um, I also just want to, want to thank Sean for those comments too, which I thought were really, really interesting. You know, one thing I wanted to ask him is, uh, one thing I've noticed is that the traditional sort of 90s era biotech model where a professor sort of has a molecule or a method for creating molecules that could be drugs and they would create companies that would pretty early on get many millions of dollars of series A venture capital and then after that series B many million, many dollars more and then they go into drug development. That seems to not be happening so much today. I mean just I was trying to find professors around Mission Bay that are doing this for a collaborative study, and I could only find a couple that had traditional Series A, but there are dozens of professors that are in, you know, kind of smaller capital, less capital intensive research tools, diagnostics, uh, you know, kind of new methods for doing all kinds of things that are commercially viable. So one thing that I think is interesting about that community is, is, is it converging a little bit with the IT semiconductor space where the capital intensity to get going on projects is, is going down. It's not that venture capital isn't, isn't important, but that traditional very linear stage model, it doesn't seem to be as, 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 as dominant as it used to be. Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. The, the, there's sort of a spread happening, especially as we get more of the, the integration of IT with, uh, with biotech. Um, and I think that's happening especially around, uh, around UCSF, sort of leveraging off the access to Silicon Valley and a lot of the IT companies that are now establishing themselves in, actually in the city of San Francisco, so within about a mile of the, of, of, of the campus. So I, I think that, that does probably uh, in some cases lower the, the capital intensity that's required. I think we have some of these other facilities that are intermediary support facilities that kind of enable uh, companies to, to, to get going up to a certain point uh, through means other than going straight to traditional Series A. I think that it's also reality, too, that it, it's been harder to find uh, you know, venture capital in recent years for biotech. It goes up and down. Uh, and that more and more companies have been sort of hanging in there as long as they can with the, the commercialization model being maybe less the IPO and more the acquisition by a major pharma company. Mm -hmm. So I think the model is, 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 is shifting. Any other questions? Well, we you know, haven't spoken yet, and that will probably be the last one. We're running a little bit behind. I just, I just quickly wanted to, to ask about the patent and intellectual property issues. So you had that great um, graph that showed the level of patenting and and then the, the, the number of, of companies started at each university. And I was wondering how, I mean, obviously patents are very important in this particular industry. How does that interact with what you're saying about the, the reduced capital requirements for these companies? Is there any relationship between patent law and the <coughs> The patent incentives that are there or not there, and the mm -hmm. the the less capital intense uh, nature of these companies. Yeah, that's a great question. I guess my answer to that is probably pretty simple: that these universities are very sophisticated in tech transfer, especially in the bioscience space. I mean, if you go to Mission Bay, the second floor of Genentech Hall has a suite of tech transfer people, a large part of which focus on IP. Um, so they're pretty hawkish at both these campuses about getting professors to disclose inventions at, the, at an early stage and then get an intellectual property around them. And I think these incubators and stuff do. So I actually think just because IP is so clearly important to this industry and the kind of interesting thing about it is that if you don't have IP, you can't disclose what you're doing. So everybody is pretty hawkish in IP because once you have the IP, then you can collaborate and disclose what you're doing. So like. Just as a far off aside, I was talking to some people um, focusing on the development of the whole kind of infrastructure in Eastern Europe, and they don't have strong IP, 
And as a result, these little nascent companies are afraid to talk to anybody because you disclose, you don't have IP, you can be appropriated, uh, and, and so forth. So I, I would say it's pretty similar. It's, it's very sophisticated, university-led IP offices, work with professors, postdocs, whoever, to develop IP, and then, and then try to aggressively go after revenues through licensing and so forth. I do think they're very generous in working with startups to, to basically go after equity-based licensing rather than asking for a lot of money up front, things like that, and that probably helps with startups. So if it's a university IP, the office will pay for it, and then through some kind of negotiated equity deal, the university will get equity in exchange for uh, some kind of license, and that, that actually lowers the barriers, the barriers to those companies because they don't have to, sh the university is paying for the IP, they're giving up some, some equity, which hurts obviously, but they don't have to license it for money early on. Does that, does that help a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Thanks again, Sean. That's great. Okay. Yeah. So, last but not least, we've been moving south and now we've gotten to the border. Um, Mary and I are going uh, in about a couple weeks to talk about uh, San Diego's. Uh, uh, IT sector to the Mexicans in Tijuana. Mary Walshock uh, with Joel West, who is right here, uh, co-authored the chapter on the relationship between UCSD and the wireless industry. <clears throat> She's an author, educator, researcher, and associate vice chancellor for public programs, and dean of extension at the University of, San University of California, San Diego. You name it. She's done it, ha has done it, will do it, or is doing it. She is a, a jack of all trades. She was seminal in creating uh, the San Diego Connect, one of the most entre uh, successful entrepreneurial networking organizations in the world. She's authored or co-authored numerous book chapters and articles on topics ranging from workforce and gender, and especially the role of the university in economic development. She's recently com completed a fascinating book, Invention and Reinvention, The Evolution of San Diego's Innovation Economy, a copy of which is on display out there. I urge you, as another ex-San Diegan, to read it. It's, it really tells you why San Diego is the way it is. Joel is a, a professor at the Keck Institute with uh, Steve and has written uh, a number of very important articles on the wireless industry, on standards creation in IT, and uh, I cite many of his works. Then we have Andrew, Andrew Hargadon received his PhD from Stanford as a professor in our Graduate School of Management and is also the director of the Child Family Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. We sort of scrunched that title down. I apologize, Andy. He's a renowned expert on the social construction and innovation and entrepreneurship. He's published influential articles in nearly every important uh, management journal. His previous book on how breakthroughs happen, the surprising truth about how companies innovate is widely uh, uh, quoted and cited. And he has a forthcoming book on innovation in the clean tech, uh, in clean technologies, which will be a must read for everyone interested in innovation in clean tech. And with that, I will turn the stage over to Mary. And Andy will be the commenter. It's hard to resist the temptation to pull in all the good ideas from all the papers, but. It is, I'm so glad we did this afternoon together because the threads that link us all are amazing. And actually, uh, what I'm about to say to you, which I think represents the threads that link us together, also, I think, animated Joel and me in writing this article with a lot of coaching uh, from our good friend Martin Kenny. Clearly, each of our regions about which we've written have deep and complex histories in terms of early innovations, you know, starting with the wine industry. And uh, it's certainly true of San Diego, as we describe in our article, about the, na the Navy. And we're talking about the Navy after World War I, not the Navy World War II. 
Um, so this history is terribly important. And also, I'm, I'm thinking, Bill, about the openness, uh, the, the sort of non-transactional character of a lot of the innovations. And you'll hear us as we describe the wireless sector. It was all about relationships and symbiotic and complementary relationships as opposed to transactions. And the other point that I think is really important, and it's very critical to our story, is how often accidents of history, unexpected events, things you wouldn't think would make a difference. So the key to the San Diego story, and uh, Martin was concerned that I had too many data files, but the key to the San Diego story is the early founders of uh, tech companies couldn't attract talent to the region. The university was able to bring talent, but Irwin, and we show this in our paper um, in the uh, 1960s when a lot of these defense contractors were building companies, they weren't hiring engineers from San Diego State or UCSD. They were bringing them from Berkeley, from UCLA, and they didn't want to come because there weren't enough companies and enough jobs for them to take a chance. So our story is very much a story of how UC San Diego very, very early, uh, by which I mean in the 1970s, became an activist partner in developing the talent pool that was uh, needed by the industry. Um, I'm going to give you just a little bit of history because everyone has. Um, and some of you have heard me tell this story when my husband took a job in San Diego in uh, 1969 when we got our PhDs. I burst into tears and I said, I can't live in a Navy town. You know, there'll be no work for me. There's nothing there but the Navy and the zoo. And because uh, I'd been to the zoo when I was in, you know, high school and junior high. And to some extent, that was the town we moved to in 69. I mean, I'm fascinated by the conversations others have had about places they lived 40 and 50 years ago. But what I failed to appreciate and what I think Joel and I have learned in the work that we've done is that the Navy was an absolutely essential factor in the growth of R&D capacity in the region and eventually the commercial clusters that exist today. And that actually occurred at the turn of the last century, not just around World War II. And, and what was important is that Navy, both the Navy and aviation had very, very early, uh, a very early presence in the San Diego region Climate had a lot to do with it, right? Because you could test equipment and you could, you know, year round. And that became, with the build up towards World War II, an extraordinary advantage. Do remember the UCSD campus opened in 1960, but its first class entered, I think, in 61 or 62. So it's a relatively young campus. But the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which in this longer Stanford book we give a lot of history of, not in this paper, uh, ended up being in uh, 1940 uh, defined by or identified by Robert Garden Sproul, then president of the UC uh, system, as the Division of War Research in Southern California. Berkeley was the Division of War Research in Northern California. And in my book, not in this article, we have a quote from Robert Gordon Sproul that says, there is no higher purpose to which the research activities of the University of California can be dedicated than to the security of democracy in the world and the national security of the country. This is a terribly important moment in history. We talked about the importance of cooperative extension, Charles, earlier today. But we can't, uh, I mean, sorry, I got my laces mixed up, sorry, uh, about uh, cooperative extension. But we cannot understate, I think, in California, the importance of uh, the military customer across the state for early science and technology. 
Now, one of the byproducts of that, and we are getting to the communication story, is that in, uh, at the end of World War II, with Vannevar Bush's focus on science, the next frontier, and the growth in federal funding for research, communities like San Diego were unusually well positioned to secure money early, fast, and in large quantities because there was already a significant number of engineers and scientists. And again, in the communications arena, back to aviation and Navy, was a terribly important uh, uh, piece of the pie. The move after World War II to try to keep the military in San Diego focused squarely on we've got to develop more R&D capacity in the region. And uh, the champions of all people for the growth of a University of California campus were, were organizations like the Chamber of Commerce. When the campus was founded, and I think this is the second important point about the gestalt of wireless in San Diego, um, the commitment was to science as opposed to engineering. And Joel really helped me understand, as did Martin, that the move away from engineering as a craft to engineering as a science, which characterized the whole United States, was terribly important to the development of the UCSD campus. And so the local industry supported basic science programs, not an engineering school. San Diego State had an engineering school, but UCSD was going to have physics and chemistry and biology. And I think that history, Stephen, may also have something to do with the different character because it was a very uh, aloof scientific faculty that were drawn to the campus. Uh, one of the early ones was Henry Brook Booker who had uh, done pioneering work in communications and he quickly attracted a former graduate student who was MI at MIT, a man by the name of Erwin Jacobs. And I think in all of our stories, and I've, I've written down six names in San Diego that are like Erwin Jacobs, and I'm sure all of you who study innovative regions can identify names like this. Erwin was pivotal and catalytic. I don't think he was the only uh, reason, or Qualcomm is the only reason, but he was a, a very critical person to this process. And this is in part because in the 60s, as the university was building its research program, its primary customer continued to be the military and the Department of Defense. And so important communications research was going on. The story in our paper is that Irwin left the campus to manage Linkabit uh, on behalf of his partners and never came back. UCSD takes credit for Linkabit as a spin out. It was not. The company he started 14 years later, Qualcomm, was not a spin out. UCSD takes credit for alumni starting companies, most of whom worked for Linkabit before they ever started companies. It's a very, very interesting dynamic. So what happened was the growth of an extraordinary cluster with Qualcomm, well, with Linkabit as really the catalytic company and Qualcomm, which was founded um, about uh, eight years after they started Linkabit, uh, as the anchor. And the story we tell in this article, and I'm sorry I'm taking too much time on early history, is that where the convergence of the university's interests and the industry's interests lay was in talent development. And so, with a lot of encouragement from Martin, we actually went into graduate studies and looked at the trajectory growth of graduate degrees in wireless-related technologies starting in the year that Qualcomm decided CDMA was going to be the platform it was going to pursue as a competitive advantage. And as you can see, there was uh, a significant growth in graduate degrees and it continues. The second area, I'm a dean of extension 
Erwin Jacobs came to me and said, I'm hiring engineers from all over the United States. They know nothing about CDMA. We need a certificate program. We designed a certificate, and you will see that there were close to 2,000 engineers that were trained through university extension for this growing wireless industry. And uh, again, echoing some of the earlier uh, presentations. And then we have our enrollments there. I think what, I'm, what we learned and what we're trying to share in our article, uh, or our chapter, is uh, that, and, and, and um, Martin was the one who suggested symbiosis, is that a whole industry uh, transformed over time, but so did the university. The content of the re research programs and we now have significant a center for wireless communication. We have all kinds of research and development related to the growth of that sector. And the Jacobs philanthropy has supported that growth. And the curriculum and the nature of the masters and PhD students uh, and projects were influenced by industry in just the way that David was talking about in the introduction, in a highly symbiotic, almost, it's almost indistinguishable way. And it's an interesting story and I think an important story. Thank you. Can I turn that off? Let's see. Mary, thank you. I uh, really enjoyed reading the chapter, and I, and I also want to take my podium time to thank David and, and Martin. I think this is a fantastic book. Uh, I spend a lot of time working with university scientists and engineers on, on commercializing their work, and a lot of time working with administrators on how to appropriately measure uh, what the university does with the science and commercialization. And, and, and this is one of those books that I look to as uh, keeping it on my desk and pulling it out every time I need to back up the fact that uh, <laughs> what we do is a little bit more complicated than measuring patents, licenses, and spin-outs. Um, so I, I, I want to, um, I think uh, basically uh, given, given Mary's uh, wonderful uh, s summary of this chapter is, is go back and underline a few things that I think were most important. Coming back to Dave's original uh, sort of mentioned that the dominant narrative of university contribution is one-sided. I mean, I, I think when, as soon as you frame anything as looking at the role of the university or the contribution of the university, you begin to establish who are the actors in this story and who are not. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's where we sort of, I, I think many of the chapters have in fact recognized what's wrong with that and, and come back and given a better and richer story about how it's a two-sided interaction. Uh, at best, but I'm going to hopefully try and make that even a little bit more complicated. So I drew uh, three uh, sort of fundamental lessons from this chapter that I thought were really important to underline. Uh, if Mary didn't, say, and then if Mary didn't say them, to sort of explicate a little bit more. Uh, the first of which is that the very origins of of UC, Day, uh, UC San Diego as a campus really was more the outcome of the local industry than it was uh, in later years the contributing cause of the growth of that local industry. I think you did a wonderful job of showing, as you stated here, that before there was the San Diego campus, not only was there Scripps, but there was Point Lomas, the, the Naval Research Station, and all of the, the, the research programs underway, and all of the defense contractors that had come there. So by the time uh, 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 of the founding of the campus and the discussions around the founding of the campus, there were already an entire community of defense contractors lobbying on behalf of a campus. And so I think when we talk about university contribution, it's interesting to see that in fact it was the industry contribution that, that formed the university. Um, uh, that uh, The second and third things that I, I thought were really interesting were actually pulling back the, the lens a little bit and looking at, at two different levels of analysis that aren't really captured when we look at universities and again when we talk about universities as actors in, in their communities and in industry. Uh, the first level of which tends to take much longer time spans than, than the, the periods we're studying, the contributions we're studying, whether that's the biotech industry or telecom. Those are measured in decades um, and the second takes a much shorter time span 
oftentimes years, a few years at best, uh, when some things happen that, that shift the course of entire regions. Uh, so that first one is the role of institutions and institutional, uh, uh, particularly um, the established networks, industries, uh, we could call them industries, we could call them clusters, we could, but essentially they're institutional networks comprised of technologies, organizations, uh, institutions, uh, non-governmental uh, non organizations, research institutes, and, and in particular the role of established networks in shaping the, essentially the character of UC San Diego. As, as the chapter does a really nice job of talking about the naval R&D stations that were established there, all of the related contractors that had come about, but also the established networks that, were, uh, that brought the faculty and the particular faculty to UC San Diego in communications and which were uh, many of whom had come out of the war-related funding uh, projects, Manhattan Project, the work at Princeton, the work at Chicago, the work at Berkeley. And they were, in, in fact, their own community, so that when they arrived in San Diego, they arrived as a community, but, and not just that, but for any faculty member who will know, but also with the connections to major grant money to establish students that they could then bring with them and to research projects that were of clear relevance and, 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 and training in that field. Uh, and, and, you know, very few universities can, can sort of be gifted that, that startup capital, intellectual capital. Uh, the third network is the network of telecom companies that sprang out of link a bit, which again, as, as Mary said quite honestly, had a tenuous connection to UC San Diego to begin with. You know, Erwin Jacobs spent two years there before moving on. And, I, and I'm actually very curious whether he had his consulting job as, you know, was that one of the reasons he came to San Diego? No. It was the consulting that he did with uh, Viterbi that started in the two years that he was there? It started when they came. So they'd been at JPL together one summer. Yeah. Well, Viterbi had been consulting for a while, right? So this was... Viterbi was a longer-standing consultant. Interesting, yeah, yeah. So when they formed the consulting group that became Link a bit and then, and then spun out or, and then Jacobs left, uh, you know, it, it's in fact that Link a bit had more of an impact on San Diego than San Diego had on Link a bit, or certainly on, on Jacobs. And, and, and as we see with all of the spin-outs that came out of that, that became the cluster into which uh, San Diego emerged, uh, UC San Diego emerged in the, in the late 70s in the 80s and 90s. Um, and that network of telecoms was, was relatively independent but also critical. And then finally, as, as Mary mentioned, the, uh, the, uh, the network of Silicon Valley and the, what that caused in terms of a resource scarcity for San Diego and put San Diego in a unique opportunity, UC San Diego, in a unique position. And so that's, I, I want, I'm going to finish up with this last bit, which is the, the third piece of this puzzle that I found really fascinating was the role that particular individuals played at particular times as these networks were coming together or going apart, as they were in, with the Silicon Valley, and how important it was that those individuals, some of them inside UC San Diego, some of them outside, recognized the impact that these networks had and were able to leverage them or at least take advantage of the opportunities they presented at the moment in ways that made San Diego, UC San Diego relevant and uh, not only relevant, but uh, uh, relevant in ways that the San Diego campus could actually benefit from. I don't think we give nearly as much credit to simply seizing the moment appropriately. And whether that was Roger Revelle, who, did, uh, who, who simply recognized the opportunity for a campus coming out of Scripps uh, and, and marshaled the resources of the local defense contractors, whether it's Clark Kerr and Gordon Sproul, who were at UC, who recognized also the opportunity in, uh, for major wartime or war-related defense funding um, to take advantage. Uh, again, you know, Mary, you mentioned Henry Booker and bringing Erwin Jacobs, but also bringing everybody else to the engineering programs. Uh, and then uh, Richard Atkinson and Mary and, you know, and, and the rest at San Diego, who recognized that the best way San Diego could serve was, in fact, through extension and through training and, and the provisioning of students. I think those are really profound because it tells us that the, you know, oftentimes what we, uh, you know, what we think the university is doing may not always be what it does so well for the community. And in these cases, what, what it did really well, as you make clear, was make itself useful to industry and, and what they needed. And so I thought these were really wonderful things to, to, to recognize, and I really appreciate the chapter for that. Right? Thank you. Well, be. I'll answer yes or no. 
What? Yes or no? Yes or no question? Uh, <laughs> well, I just I, I think what Andy said, and it was what I was trying to say, Bill, <laughs> earlier. This notion of um, what the university can do to make itself useful, you know, and that. That changes over time what we do, but that commitment to being useful, I think, is a constant characteristic of the public research university, at any rate. And uh, uh, today, wh when you see what's happening, and you, you alluded to this, Sean, but in San Diego, the convergence that's occurring between wireless and the life sciences, right? wireless and renewables, the, the, that these R&D and, and industry clusters have grown, so they're very robust, and now they start to converge in terms of addressing and solving problems, is yet another way in which the, univer the university is going to be useful in a different way. That's uh, moving forward than perhaps in my experience of it or in its earlier history. But that commitment to being useful, I really like the way you said that. My only comment. <laughs> well, if I could I just build on that a little bit, I think that you know the notion of contribution is a is a very loaded term, and if we think of universities as basically you know, as the font of knowledge that we then spill out into the local community, we you know we're we're missing we're missing. This. Uh, it's not. It's, it's more than just this passive flow of stuff. Yeah. It yeah. Does, it happens, but you have to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And it, which also comes back to where leadership comes in. The, I mean, it is, a, it is a story, as you mentioned and others have mentioned, of, of individuals yeah. acting at moments right. where they could have greatest leverage. Others might have acted at other moments, but they didn't have the opportunity. Yeah. So I'd say that uh, in some ways, maybe the notion of tech transfer and the name for it, maybe it can be expanded to knowledge transfer. And the uh, National Science Foundation in their science and technology centers uh, requires knowledge transfer to be a component of such centers. It includes tech transfer as well as all the other uh, flows of people, information, technologies. So could you comment on that? Well, I was taken with all the papers, and I'm looking at my friend, Bill Tucker. I think transfers the problem, going back to your introductory. It, 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 it suggests a linear transactional relationship, and what we know is it's not about transfer. And your Santa Barbara, I think every one of these chapters, Martin and David, gets at the, the messy, chaotic, accidental, lots of conversation, you know, lots of two-way interaction, and some things stick and other things don't stick. It's not a transfer. <laughs> and, and, and actually, so it, this, this is Bill Tucker at OP. We've actually tried to, trying to change that, that jargon in, in the president's speech. Yeah. Instead of President Napolta, we're talking about commercialization, not about transfer, because we're trying to get beyond the pure sort of patent licensing sort of thinking that people have, and you know, patents equal revenue, and revenue is good for the university. So how do we talk about and and encourage the university, you know, through our leadership to participate in this broad spectrum of 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 technology, knowledge transfer, but knowledge diffusion, whatever you want to talk about, however you want to describe it, but get it out of the the transactional mode and into the so, so yeah and let me let me build on top of that although David just just got to jump on us with the food but he, he uh, David Hodges I think was yeah was uh, he mentioned something that I wanted to build on because it was also in Mary and, and Joel's chapter the amount of industry experience that a lot of those professors brought with them that's right to their jobs uh, and 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 you know and and the and fact that the modern organization separates out. The research stream really good point. from a staff position responsible for tech transfer, knowledge yeah. transfer, commercialization, when in fact, you know, it is, it is often not even the, the transfer out, but the transfer in of experience and in, in understanding and of knowledge. industry problems and knowledge and equipment, and, equipment and, money. and money and everything else that comes in that actually shapes the research agenda that produces either practical, useful knowledge, uh, technology, or, or doesn't. 
Yeah. Right. Well, I I liked the I'd never thought about uh, it this way. I thought I thought about UCSD as a community, but your notion that it arrived as a community, I think, is very very smart. But to some extent, these universities are the anchor institutions in innovation communities, right, or whatever. But. Well, I think that point is really interesting about people with industry experience coming in and working then in the academic environment, bringing that familiarity of how industry works to um, the role of the university in that innovation ecosystem. To me, it's an interesting contrast when we talk, when the speaker talked about the biotech industries in San Diego versus the Bay Area. I mean, that would suggest San Diego's biotech industry is has some limitations to it because it doesn't have industry that that creates an environment of for its staff that would feed into presenting opportunities for those people to go into academia. So they're not publishing in industry. There isn't a lot of collaboration, so it's unlikely that those people with industry experience from that region would end up in the university community, potentially limiting some of that. Yeah, I mean, it's value uh, of the more information than you wanted, but, but, but Ivor Royston, who came as a tenure track, pro track professor, uh, once Hybertech became a successful company, was called into the dean's office, and it was recommended he become a clinical faculty member, so of course he left. Uh, now, 35 years later, the new dean of the medical school wants him to contribute to $10 million to the translational medicine program, which we are now developing. So I think you're making a very good point, but I think maybe those things can change over time. I think the, I think the culture is adapting, but I think Stephen's paper is Really, really interesting. This man back there. A student of mine said, oh, when the student is ready to learn, the teacher will arrive. And I said, no, the teacher is always there. When the student is ready to learn, the student will learn what it is that the teacher has to teach. I think that what happened in San Diego was you had a, an environment that was conducive to a need the picture you described was what was not available in San Diego. They had a great demand for a kind of intellectual development, and so they worked forward and had no, continuous progress. I think it's progress. a very good point. But obviously having Jonas Salt there was an a inspiration, if not a stimulus. No, no, he didn't even get an adjunct appointment at UCSD. The Salk Institute was a free state. Now, this is a very... I mean, that's how nasty it was, okay? No department would give Jonas Salk an adjunct appointment at UC San Diego, and he died without it. That wouldn't happen today. <laughs> yeah, but he did okay. <laughs> We're sort of running yes. I have one slide, and then I think we're going to wrap up. Here, I'll turn it back on. Thank you. Okay, this is a summary slide. Uh, kind of reiterating what Dave uh, started us with and with what I think we've learned in all of these different cases. And we, what we've learned also is that these industries are very different. First of all, the diversity of methods by which the UC campuses have had impact on their respect, on the regions that we're looking at. As Dave said, this is a very selected sample, highly successful regions, and highly successful uh, uh, departments or units. The dialogic nature of knowledge flow and the role of the movement of people back and forth in, in both directions. All are the result of research and teaching excellence. These are excellent departments. These are excellent campuses. This is not you know, some sort of practical training universities that are doing mundane work for the local industry. These are, uh, these are elite research institutions uh, and engagement. Engagement without research excellence, I'm not sure will have significant impact. And of course, we sampled 
on excellent departments. So I can't say that we've got a, uh, that we've tested this hypothesis. But when we look at what we've looked at, UCSD was built on excellence. The College of Ag here and the ENV here are excellent departments. EECS, obviously, at, at Berkeley is truly excellent. So I think excellence is another part of this story that I take away from what, we, uh, from what we've learned here. And with that, thank you all. <laughs>